Y'all, we're doing a little bit of a rewind here today for this video. And what I mean by that is this is going to be a marathon video. Now, Chad Daybell wrote a book many moons ago called One Foot in the Grave. It is the strange but true adventures of a cemetery sexton. And I did a reading of it and I broke it up into several videos and put them out. And everybody seemed to really enjoy this. I still get, I mean, I've met a lot of you through that, right? Well, as we know, the trial is now getting ready to start or going on depending on when you've seen this and a lot of you I talked to in the live chat stuff like that and you're like yes put them all together on one thing so that's what we've done we've gone through and we've clipped them together to just make one long video for those who just want to be able to hear it and if you are new to the channel or new to this and it's all put together for you so that being said now if you are new to this and you don't know anything about his book buckle up okay it's next level now what i've done is i've kept my closing thoughts in each of the chapters and whatnot but we just kind of pieced together it to make it a little bit more concise because i do as you know talk about it as i read it and whatnot it is not a serious reading of the book so be prepared for that and it's to me not a serious book it's kind of an eyesight into how this man thinks or thought i understand that people change and they do that type stuff but when we read this book it just was like oh well this guy has no respect for the living or the dad you know <laughs> so this it answers all of our questions right so that's it i do hope you enjoy this so without further ado let's begin to review Okay, so today, kids, we're reading One Foot in the Grave. Um, that did not age well. It's by Chad Daybell. Okay, The Strange But True Adventures of a Cemetery 16. Okay. 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 Chapter 1. Step inside if you dare. Okay, so here we go. We're going to begin. Ross, go buckle your damn seatbelt up, buddy. This is going to be rough. Are you looking for spooky true stories, bizarre occurrences, and to get a tingle in your loins? I'm just joking. I didn't say that. I said to get a tingle up your spine. Um, if so, you found the right place. Come inside the cemetery gate and ignore the mysterious shadows that seemingly dance away. Some people really love cemeteries, but a graveyard can be a frightening place, especially at night. Even in the most amusing settings, such as in Disneyland's Haunted Mansion, the cemetery is shown as a place where you'll get scared out of your wits. This portrayal might be on target. Let me tell you what happened to my neighbor while she and her friends were approaching our local cemetery during a fierce snowstorm. Now... Be pre-warmed. What I'm getting ready to read here, y'all will recognize that y'all this is just like a, I don't even call it old wives tale, but this is like your standard ghost story that has been told in every format. I've heard this in so many different ways. So the fact that he chose to use this as what happened to my neighbor and like pick one of the most cliche ghost stories, I think is very telling. Okay. So, as their car drove slowly, pa hold on. as their car drove slowly past the cemetery gate, my neighbor saw a middle-aged woman walking along the side of the road, carrying a baby in her arms. She also noticed that the woman appeared terribly sad and wasn't wearing a coat, although the baby was wrapped in a small blanket. My neighbor and her friends decided to give the woman a ride. It took a few moments mom it took a few moments to turn the car around, but as they drove toward the cemetery gate. The woman was nowhere to be seen. They parked the car and searched for her, thinking she had taken shelter under a tree. But there was one peculiar problem. Their own tire tracks were the only marks in the fresh snow. There weren't any footprints to be found. Golly jeepers. He didn't say golly jeepers. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> the snow was smooth and untouched along the road. Just like my loins. I'm just joking. <laughs> Yo, there's going to be so many loin references in this damn thing. Uh, <laughs> it was smooth and untouched. Just like my loins. Anyway, sorry. Okay, so it was the snow was smooth and untouched along the road where the woman had been walking a few moments earlier. My neighbor isn't the only person to mention this sad-faced woman to me. This ghostly apparition has been seen on at least three different occasions by cemetery visitors, each time in the middle of a snowstorm. 
Okay, so again, that y'all, you've probably heard that story told in some format, right? So we're going to move to the next section of the book, okay? It's called Life Among the Headstones. Some people just call me a grave digger, but my official title was Cemetery Sexton. However, a four-year-old visitor once called me the sexy one. That is inaccurate, but kind of catchy. Now, I may mention this when I read this in the live chat. This is the first, one of the first parts that I was like, oh, what? Why would you put that in there? That is so creepy. If you want to tell a ghost story, creepy story, tell that, right? Not some damn used up story about a woman disappearing in the damn snow. Why would you put that in there and associate those two things? It's just so creepy. Um, and I do not believe for a second that that happened, right? Um, which is the other part to where I'm just like, yeah, that whatever. Um, anyways, let's continue. Sexton is actually an English word for one who maintains church property. Since most English graveyards were originally situated next to churches, the word became linked to cemetery maintenance workers. But if the name still seems strange, just refer to me as many cemetery visitors did. They called me the guy. Such as, hey, are you the guy who runs this place? <laughs> now, that's some of his dry humor I think he's trying to put in there. And I'm just like, oh my God. Again, what did people see in this man? What did people see in him? What was he serving that made people lap it up and do the crazy stuff they did, right? Anyways. Next section of the chapter one, Death is Now a Mystery. Now, this part gets creepy, y'all, okay? And you're going to see why. Death has developed a frightening reputation in our modern world. We sometimes forget that for thousands of years, the burial of a loved one was usually taken care of by the family itself. I mean, y'all, it gets worse. Even some of our great-grandparents were accustomed to helping bury a family member. Being asked to dig a relative's grave was commonplace. It damn well makes you wonder what went down. Like, but see, then you think about it. Cause I'm thinking like, did he ask Lori? But then I'm like, well, Alex was there. He's a family member, right? Anyways, today we usually die in hospitals. A mortician takes away the body. The strangers handle the burial. Family members rarely see the body except at a brief viewing, which adds to the feeling of mystique and disconnection from the deceased. But death and burial are things we all face in our families, and a little education on the subject matter is better than the confusion and fear I saw among many funeral participants. So in these pages, I will debunk many graveyard myths, toss in a few true stories from around the world, like that damn ghost story, and leave some of my own experiences that leave little and share some of my own experiences that leave little doubt that something awaits us beyond this life. I mean, y'all, this is back in 2001, I think, so. I hope it is an eye-opening experience for you. All I ask is that you please leave any preconceived notion at the cemetery gate. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so how low do you go? I mean, some of these titles, y'all, I'm like, I cannot with this, right? Um, okay, so here we go. Please hold. You may have heard that when a person is buried, he is six feet under. That depth is more myth than fact. Actually, we dig the hole about five feet deep, which is sufficient. But this part just gets, it's, I can't. The days are long gone when you could wrap a body in a blanket and bury it along a trail or in a cave. Today, nearly all communi communities require that burials take place in a cemetery and a person's casket must be placed in a concrete vault. The typical burial vault is eight feet long, three feet wide, and three feet tall with a lid on. That means the top of the vault is about two feet below the ground once the burial is complete. I had to unearth a few burials, and I assure you that two feet of soil on the, on the vault top is plenty. Now, again, this just is, I mean, my God. Okay, where is the burial vault? People often ask, why haven't I ever seen a burial vault? Here's the secret. The vault is already in the grave when the funeral arrives. Dun, dun, dun. Uh, a vault company employee arrives a few hours before the funeral and puts the vault in the hole, minus the lid. The employee then places the wooden planks along each side of the grave to avoid a cave-in. The vault employee covers the planks with astroturf before leaving. He also puts a lowering casket, hold on, a lowering device across the hole. 
This device has straps and the casket is placed on these straps. When the family has departed after the service, the vault worker simply flips a switch on the device and the straps slowly lower the casket into the vault. The worker then removes the straps, puts the vault lid on, and packs up his equipment. At the next graveside service you attend, look down the hole before the casket is placed on the lowering device. You'll usually see what appears to be a white slab of concrete. That is actually the bottom of the vault. Okay, didn't know that. That's true. The next section of chapter one is called Disappearing Dirt. Okay, when we dug up a grave, the backbone... I'm sorry, hold on. <laughs> That's completely wrong. I, I said that wrong. When we dug up a grave, the backhoe operator put the dirt in a dump truck and hauled it away. Once the funeral was over, we brought the dirt back and dumped it in the hole. We then tr tamped the dirt down and replaced the sod. Some cemeteries just pile the dirt next to the hole and cover it with a tarp, but it is harder to clean up that way. Of course, not every burial goes smoothly. The following incident happened during my first week as a part-time cemetery employee. The sexton and I had just buried a wealthy older woman when we saw the funeral hearse come speeding back down the road toward us. The mortician hopped out and breathlessly shouted, Hold everything! The family wants her wedding ring! We were already tired. We protested, but we finally agreed to redig the grave. Twenty minutes later, we had removed enough soil to carefully lift off the vault lid with the back hoe. Once the lid was out of the way, the mortician hopped down into the hole and opened the casket. There the old lady was as peacefully as a dove, as peaceful as a dove. The mortician grabbed her lifeless hand and tugged mightily on the cherished ring. Uh, uh, on the cherished ring, after a lengthy struggle, he finally worked the ring off her stiff finger. He put her hand back where it had previously rested and shut the casket. Now, personally, I don't think any, I think he made all this stuff up, right? Uh, but let's keep going. He angrily climbed out of the hole and said, sorry about that. The family should have decided they wanted the ring before she was in the ground. Uh, seeing that woman's body shook me up for a few days, and I was glad to learn that redigging a grave was a rare occurrence. The incident also showed me that grave robbing isn't a viable option in this modern era. Such a task is basically impossible to do without a backhoe. Even then, it is too much work. What would you take, some jewelry and a gold fillings? Don't waste your time. I mean, why would you even think about that, right? Um, it's just so weird to hear him talking about stuff. The side of the body shook me up, but then and look at where he's at now, right? It didn't seem to bother him now. Blissfully going off to Hawaii with his, you know, little tart, Lori. I mean, this just blows my mind. Okay, chapter two. Who will bury me? A cemetery sexton is at the center of a large system of people who will keep a cemetery running smoothly. To make the stories in the subsequent chapters more understandable and entertain, I will introduce you to the people who know more about barrels than most ghosts do. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, his humor is just too much. Okay, morticians. <clears throat> This profession is obviously linked with death in cemeteries. In reality, morticians aren't at the cemetery very often, except during funerals. They usually spend their, most of their time, most of their working hours at the mortuary. The mortuary business is often a family affair and the funeral director is usually a descendant of the original founder. He mostly handles the administrative side of things, but mostly helps out during busy times. Each mortuary also has at least two other certified morticians. I greatly admire these people who have to face bloody stomach churning parts of the business. Again, doesn't age well. He'd seem to be doing just fine with this at his own hands and not even doing a, a legal mortician thing, but you know what he has allegedly done. Okay, the gender. The typical mortician is an older gentleman, but a growing number of women serve as morticians. In fact, according to the Funeral Consumers Alliance, 40% of graduating morticians are now women. Appearance. Morticians are known for being dignified and well-groomed. The men of us always wear a dark suit and tie, and the women wear stylish business attire. Essential qualities. And this is how, well, the reason I'm saying it like this is, I don't know if you can see this, but see how he does this and then does that? It's almost like he's defining each thing in there. That's why I'm reading it this way. Um, essential qualities. This is a job for someone with a strong stomach and a good sense of humor, along with a true sense of compassion. 
education. Full-time morticians graduate from an extensive college program that teaches them the basic skills they need. Smaller mortuaries often hire part-time assistants who do the hair, fingernails, and makeup of the deceased or who drive the hearse to the cemetery. Um, it is really, it really is a demanding job to, hold on, it really is a demanding job ranging from late night pickup calls to the embalming process. Of course, being a mortician doesn't always work out. One of my mortician friends left the business to sell computers at a local office supply store. He just didn't have the stomach for it. Who can blame him? Um, and I'll have to do a story time on my experience when, you know, I worked at a hair salon at one point and my boss went and a client of ours passed away. He did her makeup. I went there for the latter part to kind of help or whatever. And I'll have to tell that cause it's, it's a definite art, right? Um, it's not like normal stuff. Anyways, I'll do, maybe I'll do that on like members or Patreon or something. Um, anyways, let's keep going. We're going to the next section. Uh, cemetery secretaries. <clears throat> Pardon me. You don't find many middle-aged cemetery secretaries. They seem to either be young, efficient, and helpful, or the opposite. Fortunately, the latter group is slowly but surely joining the deceased. They have, they have so inefficiently cataloged throughout the years. Wow, that's interesting. Um, gender. The secretary is all nearly always female. Women have the tender, compassionate side that many families need when dealing with a relative's death. Okay. Essential qualities. She should strive to always have a charming smile that never fades, even during times of great stress. The cemetery secretary takes a lot of verbal abuse from distraught family members purchasing a grave, even though it's not her fault that Uncle Johnny decided to embarrass his family by getting killed while robbing a bank. Okay. Uh, optional skills. Computer literacy is very important, but I've seen a few secretaries squeak by without it. I mean, this, I'd be interested to know how long he did this to serve as this, you know, to write a book about it. Cemetery Sexton. Here we go. It's his time to shine. This brings us to the position I held for many years. I was actually quite young when I took the job as Cemetery Sexton. I was, well, I'm getting ready to have my question answered. I was 27 years old, having had four years of previous experience on the cemetery crew. But typical, but the typical Sexton is usually at least middle-aged, having worked his way through the system. Gender, nearly always male, but I expect to soon see a woman in the profession. Appearance, the attire is casual. Le Levi's and a decent shirt usually work well in trying to find clothes that can get dirty but are still acceptable to the public. I wore a hat during the summer, mainly to cut down on my chances of skin cancer. My crew wore the same type of clothing. Essential qualities. What kind of essential qualities did he have? A sexton must be able to supervise a work crew, plus do whatever else is required, such as operating a backhoe in a dump truck. Good public relations skills are a major... Plus, when you deal with grieving people. <clears throat> Pardon me. Uh, working outdoors requires... Oh, so optional skills, I'm sorry. Working outdoors requires a strong tolerance for heat in the summer and cold in the winter. Also, a sexton should be prepared to give up his weekend since Saturday is a popular burial day. That makes sense. In my opinion, this is the best occupation list in this chapter. Despite some drawbacks, you will read about later. Okay, so... Cemetery crew members. These are seasonal worker. Wait, these are seasonal workers who are employed from early April to the end of October. One member of the crew usually rises to the top and becomes the assistant sexton, and he usually stays for several years, helping out through the winter months. He is usually going to college, very dependable and the right hand man, but to reach that stage takes some time and patience. Gender. The crew is mostly male between the ages of 18 and 25. There is an occasional female on the crew, but it takes a special woman to tolerate this work environment. Essential skills. The most important one is self-motivation. Working in a cemetery can be a real drag when people aren't dying, because that leaves the crew with such chores as pruning and weed eating. I mean, this is so weird to read about, right? Um, each crew member is assigned to maintain a section of the cemetery. If someone is lazy and falls behind, he'll find himself out of a job. Of <clears throat> pardon, <clears throat> pardon me. Of course, a few workers are so tragically lazy they become legendary. One such soul was supposedly watering the lawn, but I discovered him lying in a wheelbarrow, actually snoring. He still had the hose in his hand watering the lawn. However, however, of course, when I kicked his foot, he suddenly was watering himself. 
yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, this humor is killing me. It is killing me, okay? Choosing a crew. Every two or three years, a great worker came along. I could spot this person immediately. Otherwise, it was somewhat of a gamble each spring to select three or four young people from dozens of applicants. The type of people I selected might surprise you. I, I doubt anything at this point will, right? Number one I pick is this category. I always picked a small, scrappy wrestler or soccer player first. A kid who has wrestled in high school knows how to work, has muscles, and can follow directions. Yes, he was usually a bit cocky, but I could use that to my advantage because he was often confident enough to develop into the next assistant sexton. Number two pick. Next, I selected a long-haired independent kid, the kind who would, would off-handedly mention he was the lead singer of his own garage rock band. I would make him trim his hair a little, and I clarified I wouldn't tolerate drug or alcohol use. Then he usually turned out to be a good worker who just needed some direction. Okay, that's it, right? Interesting how he just, I mean, he is like the god of the cemetery, right? The grooming, the whole, you know, uh, crew to become the next whatever. Um, okay, with these selections, my summer got off to a good start because the first two picks automatically hated each other. They had no choice but to work hard in their own sections. I mean, y'all, listen to this level of toxicity, right? I mean, the things we're hearing in here, I'm like, this guy's crazy. I mean, we know he's crazy, but this is like telling you, who says this? Who puts this in writing? Oh, I pitted them against each other. And that way they worked harder and did this because you know he probably like got off on this in some way, right? Okay, let's keep going. Uh, by the end of the summer, though, they had become good friends. Uh, one drawback was they tended to whistle at attractive girls at funerals, but I put a stop to that by threatening to give them a week off without pay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now that is creepy. Who would even think to do that, right? Whistling at somebody at a damn funeral. I've, I've seen the Whatever. It doesn't surprise me. Anyways, um, other selections. Uh, uh, let's see. Then I just added a, ver a varied group of workers. I had excellent workers who were white scholarly, and then others who had never cracked open a book. As I said, the keys to success were a good work ethic and self-motivation. Writing lawnmower personnel, I mean, I can't believe, I mean, I guess it's a book about this, right? Um, nearly every cemetery now uses riding lawnmowers. I mean, my God, I would hope so. Can you imagine? Um, I, and I had a pair of excellent older gentlemen who mowed the lawns eight hours a day, five days a week, and I hardly had to worry about them. My mowing employees were World War II veterans, and they were as tough as nails. One drawback. These guys occasionally flirted with some of the widow ladies who came to the cemetery, but that was all right. Sure. Burial vault installers, known in the business as the vault guys. Uh, the, these names are not interesting. These are just, if this is true, again, I'm kind of coming to the point, I, I don't really know how much of this stuff to believe, right? It's just interesting to read it. Hopefully we'll get, hopefully we'll become back more into reading through it, reading through the lines as opposed to these definitions, but we can also see stuff in here to see how crazy he is. Anyways. Okay. So the vault guys, uh, these men are usually work for a private company that contracts with mortuaries to provide vaults throughout a certain geographic area. Gender. Vault installers are nearly always male between ages 20 and 40 years old. <clears throat> Excuse me. Essential qualities. The, these guys need strong muscles since they must manhandle a half-ton box into a very narrow hole. I mean... You know that tickled his loins when he wrote that. Why did he have... Not with the, you know he knew what he was doing. Must manhandle a half-ton box into a narrow hole. This guy is a perv, y'all. I mean, I am just like, this guy is so creepy. Anyways, um, but we, we knew this, right? Okay, I made an effort to become friends with all of the vault workers. Most of them are in the profession temporarily and soon move on to other things. For example, one of my favorite vault guys became a county sheriff and another became a fireman. There were a few long-term vault guys, though. One guy named Jeff was part owner of his vault company, and he was excellent. He could succeed at anything and conducted himself very professionally and efficiently. Another guy named Scott was one of the happiest people I've known. I kept waiting for his enthusiasm to wane, but he ironically loved life and was just a pleasure to be around. Interesting that he's like, I mean, really? I mean, some of the stuff that he says is just like, I don't know.
Because you just look at that whole crowd of them, and I mean, they were just so bizarre. And so to hear these things come out of his mouth, where I'm like, oh yeah, this guy has serious like issues. I can, I, this is, hearing this is making more sense why he would want to try and be in control of others, and even his private life and doing this kind of stuff and this grandiose stuff. I mean, this guy had this grandiose thing going, working at a damn graveyard. I mean, come on. Okay, Headstone Company employees, known in the business as the Stone Guys. I mean, again, could we come up with something more creative? Do we even need to know them as something, right? the stone guys the vault guys i what do the vault guys do you know what i mean like really um anyways uh they these people bring the headstone to the cemetery several weeks after the burial and place it in the proper location if there is already a headstone in place these guys will sandblast the death date onto it some people think the cemetery provides the headstones but a private company handles it many private companies sell both headstones and burial vaults and so the two occupations are often combined sometimes the employees will put in the vault then place a headstone or two while he is waiting for the funeral to arrive this concludes the summary of who will take care of your body after you die. Don't worry, you'll be in good hands. Okay, that ends chapter two. It's serving self-published. It's serving, you know, that. But again, that's what it is. No shame. Again, I think it's an interesting insight into him because this is, I'm seeing just some of these behavior stuff. Like I just said, the grandiose, the I'm doing the da-da-da-da-da. And that's where I'm like, oh yeah. Oh yeah, this is like very creepy, very creepy. Some of the inappropriate jokes he's making to the four-year-old, I don't believe a kid said that. The corny dad jokes that are beyond dad jokes, that kind of thing. And then obviously it's heartbreaking to read his some of the stuff about burial things because you just have to wonder. And I mean, it's almost like he was probably like, I'm going to put my expertise to use, expertise to use in what he did, right? So there's that. So the name of chapter three is graveyard do's and don'ts although you'll find some tongue-in-cheek humor in this book i want to make it clear i have a deep respect for cemeteries and their occupants it angers me to see people act disrespectful in the cemetery pause I cannot believe I'm reading this. I mean, now it's not like he wrote this yesterday, right? Like this is older, but still, I'm like, are, seriously, seriously. I mean, I'm just like, are you kidding me? Anyways, as Sexton, I saw nearly everything over the years and I've seen proper and improper cemetery etiquette. Let's go through a few examples. The first should be obvious. Don't remove your clothing at funerals. Yeah, 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 yeah. One poor drunk soul drove his Chevy truck over a cliff and his funeral was attended by several men who lacked proper cemetery etiquette. As soon as the service was over, these guys removed their shirts and began blasting heavy metal music from their trucks. Three of them pulled cold beers from a cooler in their truck, which seemed very insensitive considering how the young man had died. A scuffle even broke out among them over the last beer. The dead man's family quickly left, obviously shocked at the group's behavior. Thankfully, the group's girlfriends refrained from also going topless, but I kept the police department's phone number handy, just in case. I hope the deceased man enjoyed his very noisy, inappropriate send-off. I mean, that's that. That's literally it. I mean, I'm not saying that's chapter three, but like that was that story. Do we believe it? No. Um, and again, it's just, it's hard to read this now knowing, knowing what we know, right? Like we can't take advice from him about how to handle yourself in a cemetery. Anyways, the next one is don't smoke until the service is over. If at all possible, hold off lighting up your cigarette and until you're leaving the cemetery. I've seen people get pretty irritated when the person next to them starts puffing away during the graveside service. If you need to smoke that badly, please stand several yards away from the group. Also, it would be nice if you deposited your cigarette butt in a nearby garbage can. It makes me feel a bit sad when there are more cigarette butts near a new grave than flowers. That happened many times. Again, how, this, why was there even a need for that? I mean, this is common sense 101. Like, why even write this? Anyways, the next one. Don't yell at the sexton if you're upset. 
Many people feel that shouting to the sextant is productive. This is not true. I don't need to explain my feelings toward a man who cursed me at, cursed at me for five minutes because an employee trimmed the rose bush on his wife's grave slightly shorter than he preferred. After such treatment, I seriously considered pruning the man's rose bush to ground level. I understand that people get emotionally attached to a gravesite, but that man went overboard. Of course, on the other hand, do bring the sex to a pizza. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, <laughs> I just cannot. Okay, y'all. I can't. It's so cheesy. Okay, here we go. Sorry. One wise lady sent me a Pizza Hut Medium Supreme for keeping an eye on things. You can be sure I kept a close eye on her son's burial plot after that. I even went out of my way to brush grass clippings off the headstone when I went past it. That generous lady followed up that initial offering every few months with peanut brittle, chocolate, and so on. Obviously, when she had a concern, I immediately hurried to resolve it. I mean, seriously, this guy is so cheesy. Another visitor gave me a box of chocolates for raising a low spot in the sod near his wife's grave, and I paid extra attention to his plot for as long as I worked there. One family always slipped a Christmas card under my door. Who would have thought of giving the sexton a holiday card? It was truly appreciated. Maybe Hallmark can start a new category. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm not advocating bribery, but showing a little kindness might pay big dividends for you. Besides, your sexton might appear to be an illiterate blue-collar guy, but he could be secretly writing a book about you. I mean, y'all, I can't. I can't. I don't know if this is true or not. It's almost like if he made it up, it's cringy, and it's like, what? And then if it is true, I'm like, dude, you're so cheesy. I mean, it's just like these people are doing I mean, absolutely, I think in a normal situation, take chat out of it. It's like, well, it's nice if people want to do that. Like if someone's like, you know, you really made me feel good. You've been tending after the gravesite, whatever. But the fact that it's like, oh, well, they did this, so I'm going to make sure to do blank. I mean, it's just, I mean, it just, it, it seems so tacky. It seems in such bad taste to discuss this, right? Like, again, I'm just like, who, you know how memes these days are like, no one, absolutely no one. This, this so that, but then the, the result is this book. I'm like, nobody asked for this. I can assure you they probably, I mean, this is so bizarre. And then to hear these things, like, well, if you bring, like, Pizza Hut, and you know he would have responded well to, like, alcohol right you know what i'm saying um anyways let's keep going okay don't betray the sexton's trust i was always eager to help cemetery visitors but i grew more wary after the following incident one afternoon a lady came to the cemetery office and we located her ancestors graves she thanked me profusely for helping her out I didn't see her again for a few months until she flagged me down and said she had recently wrecked her car on a road near the cemetery. She told me the situation and I sympathized with her. Then she went on her way and I thought I'd never see her again. The next day I received a visit from the city manager saying this woman had come to City Hall claiming I would testify on her behalf. She said the city was negligent in its road construction and should pay for her car's damage. This left me stunned, and I quickly told him, oh, 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 here's my side of the story. He thanked me, and then he returned to his office. Within an hour, the woman pulled up at my office in a rental car. She jumped out and shouted profanities at me before stomping away. Her final words were, I thought you were a nice person, but I guess I was wrong. I still shake my head over that one. And no, the city didn't pay for her damaged car. Do obey the posted signs. Most cemetery post signs that state, no playing sports, no dogs allowed. It is amazing how many people think these signs don't apply to them. 
One of the hardest calls to the police I made was when an old high school classmate started bringing his dog to the cemetery each morning. He would let his dog out of the gate and speed his car through the cemetery to make his dog chase the car. This presumably gave the dog some exercise. Now here's my thing. I've always just been paranoid about this. I do know that I've seen some people do this kind of thing, maybe not through a cemetery. And I'm always like, oh my God, what if you accidentally ran over the dog? Um, anyway, side note, so let's keep going. After the third day of this routine, I finally called the police and asked them to have an officer wait at the cemetery's bottom gate the next morning at 7 a.m. Sure enough, the pattern was repeated, and my classmate nearly ruined his tires as he squealed to a stop in front of the police car. The speeding ticket and the dog without a leash warning were enough to stop the daily dog exercise. Interestingly, my classmate never mentioned his ticket to me, and he probably doesn't realize I had part in it. He will now. I mean, what a creep. I mean, why do, I mean, the, here's the thing too, so pause. This is the level that these people, when I say these, I'm talking about Chad and this, like this crowd that's doing this like little self-publish, you know, blowing smoke up each other's butts. They literally think they're famous, right? Like Chad thinks he is famous, okay? Right, wrong, or indifferent about the dog situation. I mean, just that line right there. He didn't know I had something to do it, but he will now. You know, yeah, if he read your little self-published book that, you know, you peddled off to a few people at a house party. Um, okay, anyways. So, let's continue. I usually ignored the occasional kids in the cemetery flying kites or playing catch with a near football, but I always stopped full-fledged football and baseball games. The cemetery's open grass is alluring to young competitors, but a field dotted with headstones just isn't the place for bone-jarring ta tackles or ricocheting line drives. Again, this is a man who we know who did what he did now. So high and mighty years ago, but yet look at what was in his own damn backyard, what he was willing to do. I wonder what his classmate thinks now. Pardon me. Okay, here we go. The next one. Don't think the sexton by ruining his life. Oh, God, here we go with the martyr. Okay. This strange series of events began, began one autumn day when my crew and I disinterred a woman who... I might have said that wrong. A woman whose family wanted her reburied in another town. After the vault guy ha hauled the body and headstone away, we refilled the now empty hole and put the sod back into place. Two weeks later, a stone guy brought a different woman's headstone to the cemetery. He checked his work order, read the burial site as plot number 152, and put the headstone bloop on his now empty grave. He can hardly be faulted, since it appeared to be a fresh grave. A large winter storm hit the following day, and a new headstone was soon covered with snow for a few months. The following spring, I noticed the headstone was in the wrong place. As I checked it out, the stone should have been placed in plot number 251 instead of 152. The two spots are nearly 200 yards apart, and I was surprised the family hadn't brought this error to my attention. The deceased woman had an, an unusual surname, and I tried to contact anyone in the phone book with that same name, but she didn't seem to have any relatives in the area. After two days of deliberation, I decided to correct the area by moving the headstone to its proper location. Well, that, what a shock. What a shocking solution. Okay, naturally the change was noticed within a day by the dead woman's distant relatives. By that afternoon I had a large group of people outside my office demanding an explanation. They were certain I had moved their relative's body without permission. I explained that the body hadn't moved an inch since the burial, but these people repeatedly called me a liar, claiming there was a conspiracy. The family then called the mayor and the local newspaper saying the city was moving bodies around without notifying families and were possibly selling the body parts. They demanded I be fired immediately. Of course, I had never moved the body, which had rested peacefully in plot number 251 all winter. All I did was put the headstone where it belonged. As this strange controversy swirled around me, I asked their family spokesperson, spokesman, this question. If you paid for the headstone, didn't you ever wonder where it was? 
He promptly responded, oh, we knew where it was, and we even visited it several times, you son of a bitch. <laughs> son of a bitch. <laughs> he should have, though. Okay, he said the part about we visited it several times, though. Okay, I then asked, didn't it ever feel like it was in the wrong place? You attend the funeral, didn't you? The two sites are nowhere near each other. Well, we've had a big fight going on in the family about that, he said. Then why didn't you contact the city and find the right spot, I asked. He glared at me and said, because the city workers are a bunch of bumbling liars who move bodies around. At that moment, I just walked away. The mayor and the city council soon realized what kind of people they were dealing with. And my job was never really in jeopardy. However, the city did make an unusual request. They asked me to publicly apologize to the family for putting the headstone in the right place. Such is life. Again, I mean, if somebody has proof of this with newspapers and stuff like that, I'll believe it. Um, I just think he tries to make... He is literally glorifying this position. I mean, you would think he is the man behind the curtain... You would think he holds the damn town keys. I'm just like, I have a feeling he probably spent his days drunk digging up graves. Anyways. Do ask the sexton for help locating a grave. That story leads to this, whoops, that story leads to this obvious point. You might remember Aunt Ethel's funeral like it was yesterday. But the cemetery is constantly changing with the new headstones being added, trees getting taller, and so forth. So I've always watched for people who were wandering aimlessly through the cemetery because it was a good sign they were looking for a relative's grave, you think? And where is it? These people often weren't within 50 yards of the burial site, and they were sometimes in a completely different section of the cemetery. Most cemetery employees are eager to help you out if you approach them kindly, and it will save you many hours of frustrated searching. But he makes it sound like you need to come up with a damn pizza and chocolates and stuff. Anyways. Don't read in the cemetery at night. <laughs> I mean, I don't know who wrote these headers for him, but I mean, we're talking. This is some good work here. Okay, one curious complaint came after my crew and I readjusted the floodlight that shined on our American flag. The light had slipped a bit over the years and had been shining in the eyes of drivers on the nearby highway. The day after we fixed it, a man came into my office asking me to lower the light again. I explained it was now in the proper position. He stammered and frowned and finally said, Well, maybe this will put a stop to it. I asked him what he meant and he said, When my wife can't sleep, she'll drive out here in the middle of the night and read out loud to our daughter who is buried here. But she couldn't see the pages last night and asked me to come talk to you. He paused as if hearing what he was asking for the first time. He then mumbled sorry and quickly left the office. I didn't readjust the light. I mean, it's just, I mean, again, I don't believe this stuff. But I mean, so it's like he tells us like he's attempting to do a heartfelt thing, but then he's like, I didn't readjust the light. I mean, does he want to come off? It's like this this obsession with power is another thing that comes through here. And what was the title? Don't read in the cemetery at night. So he doesn't want her to do that. Could I see someone doing that? Possibly, yes. That makes sense. And it's sad and it's heartbreaking sounding, right? Um... I have many other questions, though. Why would you go talk to them about doing that? Why not bring a flashlight with you? There's lots of other things that I would think of before. Go ask them to change the floodlight. I mean, I, I, I don't know. That doesn't... Again, you see where there's like the holes in the story? Anyways, the next section. Don't ask me to work the graveyard shift. Since I lived in a small town, many people knew what I did for a living. Most of them knew I was a total loser. I'm kidding, he didn't say that part. <laughs> he didn't say that part. Okay, so here we go. Since I lived in a small town, most people knew what I did for a living. And some of them had no problem calling me as late as 10 p.m. to complain about something. I kept hoping they would realize I didn't do much work out there after dark. I usually politely said, thanks for calling, and I'll check on that in the morning. But in the future... Just leave a message at my damn office. 
They seemed stunned when I didn't say I'll get out there and fix it right now. I mean, he's bitter. He's bitter, y'all. I mean, just a saucy queen. Okay, go pay it. Next section. Go pay attention to the guy directing traffic. If you see a guy standing at the cemetery gate frantically waving his arms, it is usually wise to stop. <laughs> he might be wearing a hat and dirty Levi's, but he is possibly the only one in the cemetery who knows what's going on. Again, it's like he's just this level of self-importance that he tries to do. And you can see how when he started coming up and like doing these books and getting some people following him and paying attention to him and all that, I mean, this man thought he was God himself and all his disciples or whatever he believed in. Okay. I'll never forget when two funerals came to the cemetery at the same time and actually merged at the gate. As fate would have it, very few consecutive cars were going to the same funeral. I tried to stop each car and direct them to the right funeral, but most drivers would ignore me and they just sped through the cemetery to the wrong burial. It took nearly 20 minutes to sort things out and get the mourners where they belonged. It was really exciting when a mortician spotted the wrong grave, ignored my wild arm motions, and led the entire procession to the wrong gravesite. That's when I acted like a high hurdler by leaping over headstones in a dash across the cemetery to correct the problem before too many people got out of their cars. Next section. Don't expect to, to borrow electricity. I enjoy the holidays just like everyone else, but one family considered me to be Ebenezer Scrooge. Every December, they begged me to let them run an extension cord from my office to light a Christmas tree on their relative's grave. I continually refused, so they eventually took the request to the damn mayor, who supported my decision. The mayor told the family the city can't afford to light everyone's cemetery decorations. Frankly, the last thing I needed to worry about during a winter storm was hitting extension cords when I plowed snow from the roads. What will people want to do next on the holidays? Fireworks for the dead on the 4th of July? Oh, I forgot. That happened, too. I mean, another thing that's, again, so if, if even some of this is true or whatever, look at how, I mean, again, if anyone knows out there, look at how much stuff he claims goes to the mayor. Like, he's the next stop below the mayor, right? Well, I said no, and then they went right to the mayor. I'm like, is there not a manager at the damn cemetery? I don't know how it works. And I speak to the manager at the damn cemetery. Maybe he is a manager. I don't know, but I'm just like, is there not, like, a manager or someone above? He acts like it's like the hierarchy in the world is like him, the mayor, the president, God, right? And, I mean, and now it's just like he's all for it. He's all of those, right? But I'm just like... It blows my mind. Pardon me. My mouth is getting dry. Anyways, let's keep going. Okay, the next one is don't move previously buried bodies. Even after retiring, this is still my greatest pet peeve, and he really did write that. Not with us. My worst experience in the cemetery came when family members decided to reorganize their burial plots after some family members are already in the ground. I firmly believe in the phrase, rest in peace. Oh my god. I mean, no, absolutely not. This is absolutely insane. Okay, he says, I cannot emphasize strongly enough that digging up your relative is a horrible idea. Should we even read further? The proper thing to do as a family is to plan ahead where everyone will be buried. If one of your children dies, you likely will buy three lots. I advise you not to bury the child in the middle because you, because most likely you'll eventually wish you hadn't. That's exactly what happened in the following disturbing story. Here we go. God knows. Pull up. Um, in 1954. In 1954. Maybe I should turn more this way. I'm sorry. Um... In 1954, a family lost a teenage son named Ray, and they followed the bury him in the middle routine so that each parent could be buried next to him. Well, Ray's mother died in the 1970s, and by the time his father died in 1990, any sentiment for Ray from the rest of the family was long gone. They barely remembered him. The remaining siblings naturally wanted their parents buried next to each other, and in the mi their minds, the solution was simple. They'd just pay some extra money to move Ray over one spot and then put Dad where Ray had been. It sounds so easy, doesn't it? Well, we dug down to Ray's vault and discovered it wasn't really a vault at all. In the 1950s, a vault often consisted of either cinder blocks or thin slabs of concrete stacked like a house of cards. And that's how Ray's vault was. 
we stopped our digging operation and called the family to explain that things could get messy really fast. They didn't care, though they told us to just get it done. We resumed our task and carefully removed the top slabs of the vault, exposing Ray's wooden casket. We now knew the rest of the vault would just collapse if we tried to move it, so we brought in a new vault and set it along the edge of the grave. <gasps> Our goal was to carefully lift Ray's casket into the new vault. We climbed down into the hole and grabbed the casket handles to lift it out. But those ancient handles snapped right in our hands. We noticed the casket was pretty moist and I said, this thing's gonna fall apart on us. We had to proceed though and we finally put several straps around the casket and hoped for the best. We used the vault's truck wrench to slowly lift the casket and we kept our fingers crossed that this casket reached ground level. Sadly, that's the last time poor Ray was in one piece. The casket sides crumbled in and the whole thing imploded, like when they knocked down one of those old Las Vegas hotels. Suddenly, various parts of Ray were falling back into the hole in a different order than he would have preferred. I did notice he'd been buried in a nice brown suit, though. I'll refrain from describing exactly how we eventually got Ray's body into the new vault, but let's just say it required snow shovels. Again. You know, we know he has no respect for the dead or the damn living in that matter. Um, so he probably did whatever he had to. I hope Ray has some strong words for his siblings when they someday meet on the other side. I mean, you can't make this stuff up, right? Don't trust Pamela. You'll understand why is the next section. So we're going to read it. In a similar situation, a family's infant son had been buried in the center plot, and the father had been buried beside him many years earlier. Now the mother had now the mother had died, and the same clamor erupted to have mom and dad next to each other. Um, all of the remaining five children met me at the gravesite, and they tried to convince me there was plenty of room to squeeze mom next to her husband without disturbing their long dead brother. I had checked the maps and records, and I strongly disagreed with them, but they wanted me to go ahead with it. I asked why they were so sure I wouldn't hit the baby's coffin when digging the grave, and they all glanced in the direction of their youngest sister, a frightening little waif with a fake diamond stud in her nose. One of the brothers leaned toward me and whispered, Our sister Pamela is psychic. She can see the vaults underground and says everything will be fine. She says the baby's vault is on the far side. Well, Pamela ought to buy a tape measure because when we dug up the grave next morning, I hit her brother's coffin with my fourth scoop with tobacco. There wasn't even a burial vault despite the girl's claims. And the coffin was right in the middle of the plot, as I knew it would be. Of course, he knows everything, right? Of course he knew that. Even worse, I had clipped off the top of the coffin and I could see the infant's body inside. I jumped into the hole and my co-worker and I carefully replaced the splintered part and moved the little coffin onto the grass. I resumed digging the grave, but I was absolutely fuming. I don't think I've ever been more angry at a family because I couldn't get that little baby's face out of my mind. I don't believe he, don't believe it for a second. If that really happened, I do not believe he had that emotion. Uh, we finally decided to dig the grave about seven feet deep and then we reburied the baby at that level. His mother was buried the next day, a foot or so above him. I stayed in my office when that funeral arrived because I was afraid I would say something rude to the family. I found it curious that none of the family members ever inquired whether we had hit the baby's coffin. I guess I shouldn't have been surprised. After all, Pamela saw what is best for them. Bitter queen. Bitter to the damn core she is. Okay. Don't ride on the cemetery's dirt piles. A tradition among the local teenagers was to ride their motorcycles on our, cemetery, on our cemetery's dirt piles. I used to call the police when bikers would show up, but the officers would never get there in time before the kids sped away. These riders knew better than to come during a funeral, or so I thought. One day we held a funeral for an old lady near the dirt piles and it was a quiet, somber occasion. Then I heard a motorcycle engine revving up the far side of the dirt piles. I hurried in that direction, hoping to avoid the inevitable. I made it in t I didn't make it in time. Maybe the kid never even noticed the funeral before he jumped, but it was amazing to see him soar off the dirt pile and land within 20 feet of several older ladies just as the graveside prayer ended. 
It would have been a perfect fit for Evil Knievel's funeral, but it wasn't for Gladys Ripple's service. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why that tickled me. I don't know why that tickled me. Her family was not amused and they made sure I knew it. Okay, the next one is don't call the cops about your headstone. As I mentioned in the previous story, cops aren't too good at catching bad guys in the cemetery. I mean, my God. I mean, it literally just writes itself. So I've been, I've never understood why people call the police when their headstone is tipped over. Yes, it is a crime, but it is also a waste of the policeman's time. What's he going to do? Dust for fingerprints? The, <clears throat> the best solution is to tell the sexton about it and he'll let the mayor know. I'm just joking, it doesn't say the mayor thing, but you would think it would. The best solution is to tell the sexton about it. Despite popular belief, a tipped over headstone is rarely broken. It just needs to be built back on its base. The main reason to not call the police though is because the incident has an unusual angle and it usually ends up in the newspaper police report. Okay, wait, hold on. The main reason to not call the police, comma, though, comma, is because the incident has an unusual angle and it usually ends up in the newspaper police report. So within a week, there will be copycat crimes where even more headstones are knocked over. Does that, I mean, let me know, is that, that makes no sense to me. Are they trying to say it has an unusual angle, like it was a different kind of story, and so they'll put it out there, and then they'll have copycat crimes, and a nearby town, okay, so in a nearby town, a few headstones were knocked over in their cemetery, and a citizen called the newspaper. That wasn't a wise decision, though. The media blew the story out of proportion, and the story wouldn't die down. And the story would have died down. Naturally, there were two copycat incidents within a week, and suddenly the poor cemetery sexton was on TV promising to stop this crime spree. The self important. I cannot. And I actually got calls from the local media seeking my comments on the situation. I'm sure he did. Can someone please confirm if any of this stuff is true? I would love to know. I would love to know. Okay, so anyways, that cemetery had vandalism problems for several months, and it was all linked back to those newspaper reports. It was like telling teenagers, are you feeling bored? Well, remember the cemetery? Come on over and let's cause some problems. The main reason I prefer to just put the headstones back in place is because news articles on the subject usually include a photo of the cemetery workers grunting and squatting to lift a toppled stone. Of course, this type of work usually causes the workers to unintentionally show what is known in the blue collar world as plumber's crack. We all know that's not a pretty picture, especially in the newspaper. Y'all, the, the, the links that he went to to try and set that up, I think this might be a joke or an attempt at one. And the links that he's going to, I'm like, there's no way. Like, there's so many dots to connect that a teenager would not waste their time. Maybe this is a different time, though, of being like, hey, I know what we'll do. We'll go tip the stones over, and then they'll take pictures and then put them up, and we'll see the plumbers crack. I'm just, I can see a teenager tipping the stones over, but again, this, this is just, this is bad, y'all. This is really bad. I mean, this is really, 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 really bad. Um, really, 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 really bad, okay? Chapter four. Bizarre, but true. I sometimes come across cemetery-related stories in magazines or newspapers, and I often wouldn't believe them if they weren't documented. But these stories are all true, and throughout the rest of the book, I'll insert a few of these entertaining tidbits. I will start with one I'd wish I'd seen. The section header is called, Elephants Give a Little Lift. <laughs> Albert Shorty Sharp of Springfield, Missouri, spent most of his 82 years caring for and training circus elephants. Fittingly, big animals played key roles at his funeral. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. The outdoor funeral service began with huge Broadway bows slowly pounding on a drum with a mallet held in his trunk. 100%, I do not believe this already. Don't believe it. Do not believe it. Again, I might try and damn Google it when I'm done reading this. Don't believe it. Don't believe any damn thing you put in this book. Okay, so let's continue. Sorry, I just had to say that. Okay. 
then he is okay sorry i'm coming back in y'all he what if we found out that he was like plagiarizing dumbo like he was plagiarizing children's stories of bunny here and you're reading this and you're like i don't a hundred percent know it's been a hot minute since i read it but i think he's talking about pinocchio <laughs> can you imagine? like I, I, I call me crazy, but are we talking about Dumbo up in the air? <laughs> anyway, okay. So l let me just start back off. So the the outdoor funeral uh, service began with huge Broadway bow slowly pounding on a drum with a mallet held in his trunk. Then Buddy, a smaller elephant, served as a lone pallbearer ball as he slowly pulled Sharp's casket on a cart to the gravesite. I mean, I'm just getting off with this. I'm sorry. Um, send me the article. Send me the article, y'all. I mean, for real. Sharp had died of a heart failure while traveling with the George Carden Circus in Wisconsin. His body was frozen, so his friends, both human and Pac Durham, could attend the funeral during a break in the circus schedule. On a tender note, one woman had fondly tucked a small stuffed elephant under Sharp's arm during his viewing and the doll was buried with him. That was it. That was literally it. Y'all, at the end of this video, I hope I remember, and if I don't, I'll do a community post because you know I forget things these days. Um, I want to come back to this and Google that and see. I don't want to stop now because I don't want to you know, break it up too much. Okay, so the next section, Larry, lay your head on my shoulder. We'll continue the animal theme for just a moment. One winter, we buried a couple who had been killed in a head-on collision. In their obituary, it was mentioned that their dear pet Larry, their dear pet dog Larry, had also been killed in the accident. God, that's such a downer. Why do they have to? I mean, I just hate it when the animal goes too. You know what I'm saying? Okay, I didn't think much about it again until their headstone arrived a few months later. It listed the couple's name and Larry's. I soon saw the mortician who had taken care of their funeral. I took him aside and asked if Larry was actually in the ground, too. He nodded, saying the couple's children had requested Larry be buried with their parents. Oh, my God. Now, do I believe this? I mean, I could actually see this happening. Do I personally believe this maybe happened to him? No. But this seems more likely, right, of all the stories we've read so far. Like, I could see this, like, happening, right? Um, I must keep going. I soon saw the mortician. Oh, wait. Where I do that. Okay, it had cost the family extra money, of course, but the mortician had slipped Larry's remains into the father's casket right before leaving the mortuary. I figured this was highly unusual until I read a report that dealt with the subject. Often, a dog lover outlives his pet, and the owner has Lassie cremated. The pet's urn is then kept around the house until the owner dies, and then both are buried together. Families like to keep it quiet, but it apparently happens fairly often. For all I know, I may have a whole kennel buried in my cemetery. That is creepy. Okay, I understand the family's motives, though. Besides the bond the owner and pet had, it is less expensive than buying a plot in the pet cemetery. I mean, I cannot. Okay, so questions here. And again, I mean, I guess because I'm just kind of like, well, if you want to be buried with your pet, go for it. I mean, that's, I think, very touching, right? And again, this is filtered through Chad, so we can't really believe it, number one. But, like, number two, I mean, is there a reason why that would be like, oh, families don't want to talk about it? I mean, I don't understand why that would be a thing. You know what I'm saying? Like... I mean, is that like something to be embarrassed over, or is it like illegal to do that? Like, I don't, I don't know. Um, I don't understand why that would be a thing. Anyways, let's keep going. Get a hotel room or use a jail cell. Let's get back to humans. It's not just folklore that cemeteries add spice to the love lives of many couples. Oh my God! Here we go. This is probably the damn root of him and Lori's whole thing right here. Okay, I guess people seeking make-out point assume the local graveyard will be empty. I can understand a teenage couple looking for a place of solitude, but one couple who would regularly visit the cemetery really sickened me. The woman's father had recently died, so she and her boyfriend would visit his grave often, but usually their mourning turned into other passionate emotions. And they would make quite a spectacle of themselves right there on her father's grave. When I would see her car down there, I'd purposely drive the backhoe nearby to snap them out of their passion. 
and remind them that they were out in the open for all to see. They eventually got married, and I never saw them again in the cemetery. I guess the passion died, so to speak. <laughs> now, here's the thing. Do I believe it? No. Do I think Chad was probably jealous? Yeah. Do I think that he probably would have done something like this with Lori? Yeah. Just the whole thing. I mean, again, like, when you start looking at, well, they eventually got married. I'm like, well, how do you know they got married? Maybe he knew everybody in the town. I try and first look at the filter of it's true, and then I go from there, and I'm like, how like it usually quickly falls apart i don't know i i just i can't anyways another interesting case occurred during a major snowstorm it was about 8 a.m and so i was trying to get our snow plow cleaned off and ready i saw a woman pull an 18 wheeler into the cemetery that in and of itself was strange but it was followed by a city police car i figured he was going to give the woman a ticket and the two vehicles disappeared into the swirling snow I forgot about them momentarily, but as I got the snowplow warmed up, as I I forgot about them momentarily as I got the snowplow warmed up, but as I made my first plowing run through the cemetery, a few minutes later I saw the truck and police car parked at the bottom of the cemetery. I couldn't see either driver, but the vehicles were blocking my way, so I slowed down. Suddenly the 18 wheeler's passenger door opened and the cop sprinted back to his car carrying his boots. He had obviously been, give, been giving her away more than a ticket. I'm just trying to say that last part. It is that last part. Okay, so it did say the thing about the boots. Okay, so the cop sprinted back to his car carrying his boots. He hopped in his car and sped off. The diesel then moved to life and also quickly left. I, will, I was admittedly curious about what I'd seen, so I stopped the snowplow and walked to where the vehicles had been parked. I saw the footprints in the snow where the cop had sprinted to his car. This clearly wasn't just a routine traffic stop. The cop was lucky I didn't recognize him, and although I don't think I would have reported him anyway, but what I've all often wondered what he had told hold on, but I've often wondered what he had told the police dispatcher he was doing while he was out of his squad car. I guess it should be applauded. He certainly was doing more than picking up a box of donuts on his morning break. And he really did say that. I'm surprised. Look at I me. Mean, okay, it's a couple of things. First of all, I'm surprised that he didn't call the mayor, right? Because, I mean, that's just what you do in this town. Anything goes wrong, you call Chad or the damn mayor. You call the sex turner the mayor, right? That's the hierarchy. Secondly, again, it's just this power trip that he has. He's a damn graveyard digger, right? <laughs> I mean, he's ready to go to bat for, you know, he's going to turn in cops. He is taking names in that whole damn town. And, and I mean, again, this just look at how much sexual stuff has been laced throughout this book, right? First of all, starting off with the four, him saying a four-year-old told him he was the sexy one instead of the sexton. I mean, there's just some things when you sit here and put in it, and I'm just kind of like this. I'm like, and I guess it depends on the framework. Because at this point, I'm like, you've told us about a girl screwing her soon-to-be husband on her father's grave. That's completely creepy. Even if it was true, I mean, that's really creepy, right? We don't really need to know that. Like, that's like Texas Chainsaw Massacre stuff. A cop plowing a woman in the cemetery while you're snow plowing. I mean, that's creepy in of itself. Just Sex in the cemetery is just kind of strange in this context. The fact that he's making these choices to put it in here. Also, the fact that he's probably making this stuff up. Also, the fact that he's always very interested in being around the scenario, right? Um... Anyways, in fact, let me just take a sip of water after all that. That damn near wore me out. Excuse me. It plays up. Okay. The next thing, criminal mischief. Okay. It is surprising how many items are stolen from the cemetery besides someone's flowers. One morning, we arrived to find all of the batteries stolen from the cemetery vehicles. The thieves had also cut the truck's gas lines and drained the fuel tanks. I hope it was worth their time. Thieves have also taken such things as our air compressors, tamping machines, and the U.S. flag right off the pole. But our strangest incident of criminal activity involved our riding lawnmowers. I arrived one Monday morning to find our mower operators extremely angry. 
They led me to our three riding mowers and every tire had been slashed. We just shook our heads, knowing we had a long day ahead of us changing tires and getting replacements. Then I noticed a piece of paper jammed into a small opening in a nearby tree. I pulled it out and found a handwritten note that read, I can't believe you died before we could get married. I loved you so much and I want to die and be with you, but it would break my mom's heart. I will never have another boyfriend like you. So instead of stabbing myself, I stabbed a bunch of tires to show you my love. Don't forget me. Let me finish this real quick and then we'll talk. We called the police and they took the note to check for fingerprints. But they didn't find anything. I went through the records and tried to pinpoint who this person's boyfriend could be. But without success, I finally decided to just leave the incident in the past. I mean, y'all, I damn near want to call. I might just call a damn local cemetery and be like, could I please speak to the sexton? And I'm like, could you just please tell me, I'm going to name off a few scenarios, does any of this stuff remotely in the hemisphere ever happen to you? Who would in their right mind, why would you, I mean, why would you even, so I slashed a bunch of tires. I mean, come on. And then the whole thing, so he just ripped up the cops for, you know, wanting donuts and all this little, you know, cheesy whatever. Oh, you, you, you got more than getting donuts. Now he's, for, but the cop, first person they're going to call though, right? You know, <laughs> when they need, when they need, you know, help for this criminal mischief. Um, but then of course he thought they couldn't find anything. So you know, I started doing the investigation. Yeah, I'm looking around here, boys, seeing if I can't find nothing on her. You know, I didn't find nothing. We let it slide. I figured, you know, little lady had been through enough. You know, it's okay. We'll get her next time. Okay. So the next thing is called, who would have noticed? People often fret too much about things that really don't matter, but this one takes the damn cake. We were burying a man known around town as an outdoorsman. He had always been a deer hunter, and he had requested to be buried in a flannel shirt and Levi's. Once the family was gone, we lowered his coffin into the vault, and we were nearly ready to be—we were nearly ready to put the lid on when the funeral hearse returned. This is the second time in this book this has happened, and this could potentially take place, but let's keep going. We noticed the mortician had an unfamiliar woman passenger in the hearse with him. The mortician hopped out and, she, and said, I'm really sorry, but this woman is the man's cousin, and she is throwing a fit because she thinks one of the buttons on his shirt is undone. Can I check it out? She says the family won't pay us until she knows for sure. Okay, so seriously, I can honestly see people being this obnoxious and difficult. Um, do I, I mean, I don't know. I mean, do I believe it because it's from Chad? No. But do I believe this behavior out of people? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, sadly, but true. It had been a slow day, so I said, that's fine with me. Why not? We took the vault lid off, and the mortician climbed down into the dark, scary hole and opened the casket. Yes, the button directly over the man's belly button was undone. The case had been solved. No, <laughs> I'm just joking. <laughs> it, didn't, it didn't say the part about the case had been solved, but everything else. Okay. The mortician fastened it again, then shut the lid. He's also wearing long john, so he would have still stayed warm. He said with a tired smile, Sorry to bother you guys. Woo, another crisis solved. Here's my thing. And I mean, maybe, I mean, maybe I'm being disrespectful, but if this was going on right here and somebody was like, we're not going to pay you until we know that a button is undone. I mean, who does that, number one, right? Why not just crawl down in there and pretend that you saw it and said, yeah. I mean, seriously, like why continue? I mean, seriously, just move it along. You know what I'm saying? Move it along. I mean, this is ridiculous. I just don't even think that happened, right? I mean, that's my stance on it. I just don't even think that happened. Anyways, um, in the next section, shoeless. I always do my best to keep the morticians happy. If they're happy, I'm happy. But one request was a little unusual. Now he says this about this as if half this damn book, if it was true, is not is the norm, right? Um, like cl climbing down to the damn grave to may undig somebody and make sure a damn button is done up is completely normal, right? Okay. Anyways, uh, I'm okay. So where are we at? 
Thank you. As the family gathered around the grave, the mortician pulled me aside and handed me a pair of Sunday shoes. He said, we forgot to put his shoes on. Whose shoes, I asked. The deceased, he said, you blubbering idiot. He didn't say that. When everyone is gone, could you just pop the lid and put on his feet? Put them on his feet? I reluctantly agreed, but when the moment of truth arrived, I failed. We opened the lid slightly, and I felt around for his feet. But my hand went up his pant leg instead. The feel of his cold, fleshy calf nearly made me gag. I finally found one of his feet, but it was rigid. That was enough for me. I quickly placed the shoes near his feet and closed the lid. I queasily told my co-workers, he'll just have to put them on by himself. <laughs> now, here's the thing, and this is just side note, and I'm not trying to be like a snob or anything, because I don't have any books published. I don't have even a self-published book out there. But anyone who's done like basic creative writing one-on-one -on -one will tell you lines like, I queasily told all my co-workers are like basic 101 you never you absolutely do not do stuff like that you show them you don't say it i queasily is like cringe right but i mean that's here nor there at this point okay ashes or gravel some people choose to be cremated before having their ashes buried in the plot, in the family plot. I don't mind since the size of the hole is much smaller. I can actually dig it by hand. One misconception is that a cremation is nothing but pure ashes, like the kinds you would find in a fireplace. Actually, the cremation process isn't that pure. I found this fact the hard way. The first several cremations I buried had arrived in nice solid boxes that weighed about 10 to 15 pounds. I would just put the box in the ground and fill the hole. The one fa Then one family dropped off a lady's cremated remains and requested that her ashes be placed in the same box as her deceased husband. Uh, the family members claimed... Hmm? Pardon me, I had a little yawn sneak out. Uh, let's see here, where we go? The Hold on. Oh, here we are. The family members claimed there would be plenty of room. They then went on their way, saying they'd be back in two hours to have a de dedicatory service. Well, I dug around and found the original box, and there was no way the second box would fit inside it. I knew the family would be back soon, and I wanted to honor their wishes. So I popped open the second box and pulled out the cremated remains, which were contained in a sturdy plastic bag. I couldn't help examining the contents. There certainly were some ashes, but there were also shards of bone and a few teeth. I guess they don't burn well. I opened the first box and molded the wife's remains around the husband's plastic bag the best I could. Then I closed the lid. I couldn't help thinking that Resurrection Day is going to be complicated for those two. It could look like a game of Twister. <laughs> Let me get a sip of water here. I mean, this one's, this one, this is a long chapter, y'all. This is, again, it says 17 minutes left and my thing right now says 20 minutes. So we know 20 minutes is where I started to go like, oh my yeah, I'm going to like punch myself in the face. Okay, here we go. A fitting farewell. As we all know, arrogant people are usually difficult to be deal with. Unfortunately, I mean, as if he's not one. Uh, unfortunately, the most arrogant ones can be annoying even in death. One local attorney had specified in his will that he desired to be buried in the largest coffin available. He wanted to go out in style. After the attorney's last breath, his family honored his wishes to the letter. My eyes nearly popped out of my head when I saw ten pallbearers struggling under the weight of his monstrous casket. You could have housed a small family inside that thing. To accommodate the monstrous casket, the mortician had specifically ordered the largest burial vault made in the United States. It was so huge that the family had to buy an adjoining lot because the vault was too wide to fit in a single burial place. I had only buried the other person in such a large vault, and that person had weighed nearly 500 pounds. <clears throat> Pardon me. This attorney had been average size, though, and we were only going through all of this trouble because he wanted the best. He was about to get it. We lowered the casket into the vault, and it fit by the narrowest of margins. But when we tried to put the lid on, it merely clanked around. The casket was six inches taller than the vault. 
The Volgai hastily called out the mortician, who had returned to the mortuary with the family. He tried to talk the man's children into switching their father's body into a smaller casket, but they wouldn't budge. Their father had one of the best and nothing else would do. When we heard that news, we felt pretty frustrated. It was getting dark and rain was falling. Then the vault guy smiled and said, Well, we've got an old septic tank at the shop we had to drain and pull it out of the ground. He ought to fit in that. We readily agreed, so he called the mortician back and asked him to tell the family. We had the problem solved. We widened the hole a bit more and the vault guy retrieved the used septic tank. He returned and lowered it into the hole. The stench wasn't too bad, and most important, that huge casket fit inside just fine. As we put the finishing touches on the grave, the mortician drove up to learn how we had solved the problem, and when he found out what we had done, he laughed so hard he started crying. I love it, he said. The guy always treated everyone just like the stuff that once filled that tank. What a perfect send-off. The irony in that one is very obvious. I mean, and again, maybe they did this. I don't know. I don't know if y'all like remember some of the stuff, but you, like when things go wrong at like I don't know if it's cemeteries or the places where they do the bodies and stuff, but like where it's like, oh, well, we ran out of room there, so we just started stacking the bodies up, and now there's like a hundred back there. You know what I'm saying? Like where you hear these articles and you're like, oh my god, they're like in cars and everything. Urgh! So for them to be like, if this happened again because it's Chad, do I believe it? No. Uh, but for them to be like, here, dug up the old cramper out back and uh, buried him in there. Yeah, did you find? I mean, I'm just like, place, that's par for the course. All right, the next section. Just pay the shipping. The following story made me smile. <laughs> Only because I know so many people like this woman who make crazy decisions just to save a few dollars. I won't include her last name. I'm sure this lady has suffered enough. In November 2000, a woman named Janet put her dead mother in her car's passenger seat and drove more than a thousand miles from Colorado to an Oregon mortuary so that her mom could be buried next to her father. According to the Jefferson County, Colorado Sheriff's Office, Janet said she was trying to save money on the cost of shipping the body of a 91-year-old Mildred to Oregon. Transporting a body across state lines without a death certificate is illegal, because, but authorities chose not to press charges against her. Janet told authorities that about an hour after her mother died in a home near Denver, she dressed her mother's body in a fresh set of pajamas, carried her to the car, and then took her off to Oregon. After the mess was sorted out, a brief funeral service was held for Mildred. Mildred. She was then buried next to her husband in a Portland cemetery. Her daughter was not available for comment. Did the family, the next section, did the family ask for postal insurance? Several times I've received a cremation in the mail with instructions to bury the remains in the family plot. I doubt the postal worker had any idea what was in the package. However, there have been cases of a cremation ending up in the wrong address, ending up at the wrong address. One newspaper article told of a woman's cremation getting lost on its way from Michigan to Idaho. It was eventually found on a post office shelf in California. Of course, if you don't trust the Postal Service, you can take things into your own hands. We had one family haul their deceased grandma and her casket across several states in the back of their station wagon. Is anybody getting Little Miss Sunshine vibes from this? If you have not seen that movie, you gotta watch it. Okay. I thought those kind of, kinds of adventures only happened in movies. The family had the proper permits to transport her, but it was a weird sight to see young children sitting happily on the side of the casket. That's a trip those kids will never forget. Wait, hold on. Okay, what's that smell? I once received notice from a distant mortuary that they'd be bringing me a body for burial the next afternoon. The next day, I kept watching for a hearse to arrive, but instead a car pulling a U-Haul trailer arrived. Sure enough, inside the trailer was a coffin. That trailer still carried a strong, distinct odor long after we took the coffin out. I felt sorry for the next person who rented that trailer. The next section. That was it, by the way, for that one. That was, that was all there was to it. We only read the articles. Our cemetery is quite unique. 
It has the uh, it has quite a collection of adult magazines and videos. This because he was there does not surprise me. They, they before we even go farther, I'm guessing that he was like the what do you call it, the librarian of them or something. He probably edited it up. Uh, and again, notice the theme. We're going to continually see themes of adult entertainment, adult sex stuff going on in the cemetery with him there. It's very weird. It's very unsettling. Okay. Our cemetery is quite unique. It has quite a collection of adult magazines and videos. Of course, this collection is several feet underground. <laughs> 100% he's dug it up. If it's even true. 100% he's dug it up. Ouch. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Excuse me. Oh my god, it's got me snorting, y'all. Y'all know it's for real. <laughs> Get to <those> snorting. <laughs> sorry. Okay, here we go. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, here we go. I got. Whew, I'm sorry. That one got me. It, it's just so funny when I do that. I'm sorry. It tickles me to death. Okay. A few years ago. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh. oh my god, look at my ear. Look at my ear. Okay, here we go. A few years ago, the local police raided a home and found a huge collection of, you know, porno. Uh, the police department didn't want those items to get back among the public. So, they... They hatched the novel idea of burying the collection in the cemetery. Sadly, I have a story about our local police department that is, I know for a fact, true. That makes me honestly think that this probably is true. Um, anyways. So, I might do a little story time on that sometime. Our crew dug a deep hole in a spot where a cemetery road would soon be placed, and the police arrived with their stash and locked boxes. These boxes were buried inside two burial vaults. The vaults are ten feet deep and pavement now covers them. I can't think of a better place for such items other than a crematorium. Oh, pull out. 100%. Trust me, it was kind of stuff that the police were like, this is bad enough to, first of all, I mean, y'all, even though, I mean, I can kind of see that in a way because I'm just like, I mean, they've done crazier stuff. But on the same note, I'm just like, oh, he totally dug that up, y'all. Totally. Again, with the theme of all this stuff going on, please. I'm just, and for him, oh, well, the theme of that, oh, please, honey, as if it's not all stashed under his damn bed at home or, you know, back then. Anyways, the next section. Dim bones, dim bones. Speaking of trashy material, <laughs> our cemetery garbage cans collect interesting things besides wilted flowers. Can you guess the number one item? Chicken bones from KFC. Apparently, eating Kentucky Fried Chicken during cemetery visits is very popular. I mean, it's good. Good God almighty. And you can't beat their mashed potatoes. Okay. McDonald's Happy Meal boxes are quite are also quite abundant. I can just picture a father announcing to his family, Hey kids, please quiet down while we go through the drive through window. If you behave yourself, we'll go eat at Grandpa's grave. <laughs> I personally don't see many people eating in the cemetery during the day, so it must be more of an evening snack kind of a thing. Yum yum. Of course, we occasionally find drug paraphernalia in the garbage cans, so apparently some people find other ways to relax during their visits to the funeral, to the cemetery. It just looks for every moment to make himself feel better against people. If somebody wants to mourn their damn KFC, let them mourn their damn KFC. I mean, my God. Anyways, Peculiar Picnic is the next section. One family took things a little too far, though. When it comes to the post-funeral luncheon, most families gather at a restaurant or a church for a safe food platter. Um, for a brief meal following a funeral. But this family decided to have a picnic right next to the grave before we'd even buried their grandpa. The woman spread out blankets and brought picnic baskets from their cars while the men hungrily, again with the, with the adverbs, uh, grabbed sandwiches and then lounged under a tree to watch us work. I didn't want to be the family's entertainment, so I asked the deceased widow if they wanted us to wait to bury her husband while they finished eating. Heavens no, she said. It'll be interesting to watch. The next ten minutes were excruciating for me as the vault guy and I did our best not to make a mistake. I mean, come. Fill the damn hole in. <laughs> Just fill it in and move on. I mean, my God almighty. 
For someone that wants all eyes on him the second he damn gets it, then he wants to be a drama queen. All the while we were being watched by 20 pairs of eyes. The only sounds to break the silence were people munching on damn KFC. <laughs> I'm just joking, it says. The only sounds to break the silence were people munching on potato chips and the occasional crunching of a pickle. Watching the burial of a loved one apparently didn't affect their appetites in the least. I mean, he says this, and then, you know, we know what we know now. But again, it's this kind of pettiness right here where I'm, I mean, okay, so this is just me. And I'm trying to think, but I mean, I'm also kind of like, I mean, to each their own or whatever. But I mean, and maybe I'm weird or whatever. But I'm like, I mean, it, I think it might be kind of interesting to watch someone finish doing the great thing or whatever. I don't know. Um, do I believe that this happened? Probably not. Again, I get said it a hundred times. I just don't believe that any of this stuff happened. But the things that he chooses to get so high and mighty about, I'm just like, dude. You know, again, just, we tried our hard not to make a mistake. I mean, all eyes are on us. We almost had to call the mayor. Okay. The next section is called Down on the Farm. Large animals shouldn't be a major cemetery concern, but I cross paths with them more often than I'd like. For example, at one graveside service at near at, at was hold on. For example, at one graveside service at was nearly dark. This is weird. And everyone was milling around, but the preacher refused to start the proceedings. Almost 15 minutes passed before a man riding a horse came to the cemetery gate. He actually was wearing a bandana, a hat, and an eye patch. As he approached, he yelled, I hurried as fast as I could. He tied the horse to a tree and joined the group. The mortician later said the guy had also been at the church. The preacher had agreed to wait for the guy to gallop from the church to the cemetery. The mortician heartily... There we go. Uh, we're going to take a shot every time he does it. Um, but I only have Coke and water over there, so. Uh, let's see. The mortician heartily agreed with me that maybe next time the cowboy could leave the horse in the barn and just catch a ride. Less than a month later, another animal made a memorable appearance. I was sitting in my truck waiting for a funeral service to end when a large cow came rambling through the cemetery toward the burial site. I jumped out and tried to herd the cow away, but it seemed determined to reach that graveside service. One of my employees, Tony, also spotted it, but neither of us could change his course. I'll see it in a second. But neither of us could change his course. The family of the deceased had also seen the cow, which was now within 15 yards of the casket. Some of the mourners were laughing, and a few of them even snapped photos of the occasion. Finally, Tony grabbed a long stick and prodded the cow away from the funeral and into another part of the cemetery. I called the city's animal control officer to come help us and he eventually lassoed the cow and led it back to the farm where it belonged. I'll never forget though how badly that cow wanted to take part in that funeral. Out of curiosity, I checked the background of the deceased lady to make sure there wasn't some strange cosmic connection between her and that cow. See, here we go. He's already starting. He was probably starting back with this like, well, I did her numbers. And I found out that her and the cow had been married 25 times. You know what I'm saying? Um, okay. By all accounts, she had just been a typical housewife. Although her obituary mentioned she was a vegetarian. I mean, give me a my God. Maybe the cow just wanted to stop by and tell her, Y'all, hold yourself for this. Hold yourself for this. I'm going to read the sentence over again. Because we damn well might not look at the damn Golden Girls ever again. Might not damn read it to you. Okay, by, okay, so well, let's just go over this again. This is how bad this is. This is iconically bad. By all accounts, she had just been a typical housewife, although her obituary mentioned she was a vegetarian. Maybe that cow just wanted to stop by and tell her, thank you for being a friend. I mean, oh my, I swear to God, he sets them up for these jokes. Like, I can see Melanie Gibb right there being like, yeah, that was really good. I, I mean, when I got to that part, I was like, this is a bestseller. It's a bestseller. What do you think, Mom? I mean, seriously. This is what happens when you surround yourself with yes people. I just, I can't. Okay, so the next section. It's called, but also look at this part. 
Like all of these things, he just turns his nose up at the situation. It's like so dismissive, so whatever. And I'm like this. Okay, so a lot of these things, I'm trying to imagine like a super, like say, really conservative traditional family that's like really like, and not maybe even traditional conservative is the right way to say, but like, how should I say it? And like a family that would be offended by or like, um, uh, like that. Like the scenarios that he's describing, I'm like, well, maybe they would be horrified that a cow approached them. You see what I'm saying? Like, oh my God, a cow's ruining the wedding. This is, or the, the funeral. This is supposed to be perfect and this and this, and it's supposed to go all this way. You see what I'm saying? That kind of a thing. Like just very traditional, very, it's supposed to go this way. We can't have a cow interrupt it. Whereas I would be like, oh my God, that's so cute. A cow's here. You, you get where I'm going. Um, so that type of thing or whatever. Uh, but I don't, but then reading this, oh, the family I thought was cute. So I'm like, well, most of the family's not like they're cool with this shit, with this stuff. You know what I'm saying? It's him that has this issue. Um, you know, so I'm just like, you know, it's, it's weird. Anyways, let's go back to this. Okay. So the next section is called, I would take a cow. Wait, I would take a cow any day. We figured out how to handle a cow, but didn't do so well with large spiders. One summer, I began noticing beetle-sized spiders hanging in the cemetery's trees and bushes. And that right there, I would have been done. I would have quit. I would have burned the entire town down. I'm absolutely not. Anyways, uh, a nearby mountain is notorious for such creatures, and after a wild windstorm, we found dozens of them all over the cemetery. They must have been blown all. They must have been blown all the way across the valley. It took us several weeks to get rid of them, and they gave me the creeps. <clears throat> Pardon me. I would never stop near a tree, and suddenly one would. Oh, hold on. I would stop near a tree, and suddenly one would lower itself to eye level. Ugh. Uh, the whole crew was jittery until we got rid of them all. Another summer, we battled hordes of grasshoppers. You know what he's doing? It's like he's lining up. Like I forget what you call it, but like. Like, remember, like, when the, the lotus and things like that or whatever? You know, the great the great summer of, like, grasshoppers and, you know what I mean? Anyways. Um, they would come out of a nearby field and literally cover the roads. People would come to funerals and freak out to see the ground crawling with bugs. It was like a horror movie with women shrieking and stumbling back to their cars. I was quite embarrassed. We tried everything to eliminate them, and we finally bought a product called Bug Be Gone. It worked miraculously, and you too can own some for nine ninety nine by sending a check or mail. No, I'm just joking. He wasn't doing a plug-in, but it would not surprise me. Uh, but they did get a thing called Bug Be Gone. It worked miraculously, and so we stocked up on several hundred dollars worth of the stuff for the next year. Naturally, we never had a massive bug problem again. If you need some Bug Be Gone, I know where you can get some really cheap. Now, he did say that. I predicted it. That's so weird. I shouldn't have corrected myself. Um, he just didn't give the address and didn't give, like, a place to send a money order. The next thing is getting a leg up. I'm just, like, all comfortable. I'm lounged back in my chair reading this, you know. I'm <laughs> just, like, over here kicked back. Okay. My favorite headstone in our cemetery tells the story of its occupant who made his way to the grave in two parts. The first... The first came in the late 1800s, when as a young man he tried to stop a bank robbery. While pursuing the thieves, his left leg was shot off below the knee. Ouch. He survived, but his family didn't expect him to live long, so they just buried his leg in a box in the family plot, expecting that he'd soon follow the, le that he'd soon follow the leg into the ground. But the man pulled through. And he didn't die for another 40 years. When the cemetery crew dug his grave, they found the long-forgotten leg. The workers wrapped it up and slipped it off his coffin during his burial. So after four decades, all of his body parts were reunited. Speaking of detached limbs, we have in our cemetery database this burial record from the early 1920s. The lower half of Miss Robinson's leg. There's no indication that the rest of Miss Robinson ever made it to our cemetery, and she is certainly dead by now. I have often wondered, though, if she ever hobbled out to the cemetery to visit her missing appendage, what would she have at the graveside? A sock and shoe? <laughs> I mean, just the humor. It's just top-notch. Okay, the next section is called Rock On. One July day, I read in the newspaper that a terrible accident had claimed the lives of three sisters from our area. 
The women were all in their mid-twenties and were the fan club presidents of a modern rock band. In fact, they had been traveling between concerts when they accidentally drove off a cliff. I hadn't ever heard of the band before or since, but as the sisters' family came to select a gravesite, they were excited that the band had agreed to attend the funeral. I would tell you the band's name, but I honestly can't remember it. You know this isn't true. I mean, I'm, I'll, you know this isn't true. Already from right there, I'd tell you, but I don't remember. They drove off a cliff. It's all generic cliche stuff. He's probably describing a movie. He's probably, it's, he's, it got, Thelma Damn Louise. If the two of the sisters are named Thelma and Louise, I'm done with the damn book. I'm done with the damn book. Okay. <laughs> there we go. Okay, so here we go. On the day of the funeral, the family arrived early for graveside service and waited expectantly. Yep, take a shot, expectantly, uh, <laughs> for the band to arrive. The girl's uncle told me these guys are going to be huge. They just finished their first video. Within minutes, a black stretch limo pulled into the cemetery and parked in front of my office. A huge security guard leaped out and scanned the area and then shouted at me, Stay back! Don't bother the band! Yeah, as if I'd been wanting to mob them. Then the three band members got out and they looked ridiculous. These stars were wearing some of the ugliest clothes I had ever seen at a funeral. And that's saying a lot. One, one man wore what looked like a dirty brown blanket, and the other guy wore what could only be described as a mini skirt and a halter top. When a woman who obviously fancied herself as the band's main attraction got out of the limo, her jet black hair was spiked, and she was wearing white face paint, which didn't go well with her nearly transparent pink, pink plastic dress. She strutted around with her nose in the air, clearly miffed at the lack of fans there to worship her. In fact, all three seemed quite perturbed at having no one at having to attend the burial of their fan club presidents. Of their fan club presidents. At the graveside serv as the graveside service ended, those superstars basically sprinted back to their limo. I overheard the guy in the miniskirt say to the driver, Step on it, let's blow this joint. He actually wrote that line and said that as if we're supposed to believe that. You have to admire entertainers who truly connect with their fans. Y'all, that, I mean, I cannot, and people probably lap this up. Like thirsty dogs in the middle of a damn heat wave in North Carolina summer. I mean, you know they ate this up. I mean, down to the cliches of the whole, the, what the band looked like. I mean, and what's so funny is he gets all pissy about that. But are these not the most narcissistic, sociopathic, psychopathic, serial killer pathic people that we've ever damn met? It's the hypocrisy for me. Chapter 5. Myths versus Facts Over the years, many mythical cemetery stories get passed from generation to generation until they become accepted as truth. This happens through urban legends, rumors, and even horror movies. I'd like to set the record straight and on a few things of these myths, partly because I believed most of them myself before becoming a sexton. Myth Teenagers like stealing cemetery flowers. Fact. Old ladies are the most common culprits. So pause. I can't even get one paragraph in. Has anybody, please let me know in the comment section, has anybody heard that there is a myth that teenagers like to steal cemetery flowers? This is the last thing I would think they would do. Having sex in the cemetery? Yes, I could see them doing that. Knocking the cemetery things over? Possibly. He already covered that in previous chapters. Stealing the flowers? No. Anyways, let's keep going. Teenagers get blamed for a lot of things, but stealing cemetery decorations shouldn't be one of them. With all of the worldly enticements available to them, do you really think teens are sitting around scheming about how to rob flowers from graves? Here is what really happens. An older woman will get out of her car and innocently walk around. Then she will pause at a headstone and remove an item or two from the grave. It is really hard to tell if she's a relative of the deceased or a grave robber. I vividly remember one older woman who scoped up an armful of artificial flowers from a grave and put them in the trunk of her car. She hadn't noticed me, and although I was suspicious, I didn't feel ready to confront her. 
A week later, she showed up again and casually strolled through another section of the cemetery. She stopped at a new grave that was well decorated with flowers, but hadn't received a headstone yet. There were headstones on each side of the new grave, but I knew this particular burial wasn't related to any of the people listed on the nearby headstones. The woman had removed a few decorations, and I quietly approached her before asking, Can I help you with anything? At the sound of my voice, she jumped into the air and let out a small yelp. She quickly composed herself and nervously said, I'm just here visiting my friend's grave. Now, if you're new here to me reading this, anytime he uses an adverb, because literally he describes like everything with an adverb, if you are drinking currently, go ahead and take a sip or a shot or something like that, right? You will be blacked out by the time I get through one page, okay? It's that bad, right? Okay, so let's continue. That's nice, I said. What was her name again? The woman glanced at a nearby headstone and said, Glinda, Glinda Jackson, you jackass. I smiled and said, oh, really, I swear I buried Robert Hardy here. The woman knew instantly she was caught. She dropped everything and hurried to her car as fast as her 70-year-old legs would take her. I just stared at her as she drove off. I hope I cured her. I have never seen her in our cemetery again, that's for sure. A few months later, a cemetery to the north of us suffered similar thefts, so the police put a tracking device in a very attractive flower bouquet. They... <laughs> I'm... Is this real? <laughs> is this... Okay, now, I, again, this might be real because remember how I'll ask this throughout. I'll be like, y'all, please, is this real? Because, again, I'm just like, if they... And I get where this could be. Like, if you're putting stuff out there and someone's stealing it, I get that would, like, piss me off, right? I get that. But the stories that he comes up with are so out there. Now, someone did provide evidence in the last video of the story about the elephant and the circus thing, and I was like, oh, my God. Now, also, the shocker is that he literally plagiarized the entire damn story for his book, right? So, there's that. But it's not really a shocker since he did it. But like this, I'm just like, where does he get this stuff from? Right? And it, it like all happens to him, allegedly, right? Anyways, so the police put a tracking device in a very attractive flower bouquet. They placed the bouquet on a fresh grave and waited. The bouquet disappeared from the grave within two days and they tracked it to an older woman's home. A quick search of her garage produced dozens of cemetery decorations that were easily identified by families in the community. The woman had to pay a hefty fine, but the public humiliation she faced was surely much worse. I wondered if it was the same woman, but I saw her photo on the TV news and it wasn't her. I mean, he would have brought her out for a damn public stoning. I mean, I'm just like, oh my God. Now, I will say if any of that is true, can you imagine the humiliation of being caught with it? Now, I don't know what, I can't remember, and I'm not going to go back right now, what year this was written in, and who knows where, if this is true. If the story is true, what year this is from, but like... I could see somebody doing this in this day and age and, like, hawking them on the eBay, right? Free shipping, free returns. You know what I mean? And, like, changing the name on it to, like, your family's name. Sadly, this is the state of the world we're in. Like, I would completely see this happening, right? Um, but then somebody hoarding them. I can also see that, too. This is sad. We're in a sad state of affairs, y'all. Okay? Because, sadly, I'm just like, I can see this happening. Anyways. Um, here we're going to the next one. Myth. People are laid to rest in silence in the rain. Fact. Rock music is a part of most burials. And then he goes into describing this. Mo <clears throat> most vault guys really enjoy listening to rock music. If a family stayed to watch us lower the body into the ground, I made the, I made the vault guy, hold on. Hold on, this sentence is very weird the way he has it written. Okay, we're going to repeat it. I'm just, I got to break it down. Okay, these are some of the pitfalls with the self-publishing situation. You know, nothing wrong, but it is what it is. Okay, if a family stayed to watch us lower the body into the ground, comma, I made the vault guy keep the radio off. Okay, I see. It could have just been me. I get it. Okay, but if it was just the two of us, I didn't mind if he turns on some music. Okay. It resulted in some funny incidents, though. One classic moment was when we put the vault lid on and Queen's hit song, Another One Bites the Dust, started blaring from the radio. Perfect timing. 
but the most memorable music event occurred when the vault guy's lowering device was broken. The device usually lowers the casket smoothly, but this time the vault guy had to lower it using a wrench, which made the casket rock back and forth. Just as he started lowering the casket, Oingo Boingo's upbeat song Dead Man's Party came on the radio. With the way the casket was rocking back and forth, it really looked like the 90-year-old woman in the casket was shaking her groove thing to the song about dying and then attending a party in the spirit world. I started laughing and said, wow, this song really fits. I think she likes it. I right, let's see what's next here. Then the vault guy paused a moment to listen to the song as the casket it shifted one more time. Then he just roared with laughter. He had to stop lowering the casket to kneel down on the grass and wipe away his tears. I guess you had to be there. <laughs> I mean, you could say that for most of his books, right? Or most of his jokes in here. Okay, he's going on to the next thing. Myth. People often get buried in the wrong place. Fact. Very rarely. Maybe once every few years. A sexton knows his cemetery like the back of his hand, and a good one will double-check himself as he begins digging each new grave. Mistakes are extremely rare and almost impossible. But one of the most common phone calls I got as sexton went something like this. Hi, you buried my husband yesterday, and I haven't been able to sleep a wink. I know you buried him in the wrong place. There was usually no rational reason for this concern. I was never able to convince people over the phone that everything was fine, so I would meet with them at the gravesite with my maps to show them everything was in order. I did my best to be cordial because I knew the family was going through a hard time. I was always happy when, when relief would cross of their fate, when relief would cross their faces as they realized everything was okay. The previous sexton did make an error. Of course, the previous one, not him. The burial was one plot off. But he discovered the mistake the next day and corrected it before the family ever noticed. The next one. Notice again, Chad would never make the mistake here, right? Um, okay, here we go. Myth. The direction the headstone is facing shows where the body is buried. Fact. The stone is always... Excuse me. Pardon me, on the west side of the grave. Y'all yeah, gotta take a swivel. It's happening. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm not laughing at the thing. I uncontrollably start yawning when I read his book. Hold on, I gotta take some. I'm also thirsty. I'm sorry, I know that bothers some people. But I've gotta take a sip of water. Um, I uncontrollably will start yawning, right? And I just need to, I need to reel it in. It's almost like my body and mind and spirit like reject the book. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> it's like they reject it, right? Okay, so here we go. I just read the thing that we're going. The, so the facts, so let's just read it again because I, I kind of, I lost time. So the myth is the direction the headstone is facing shows where the body is buried. The fact is that the stone is always on the west end of the grave. The myth is related to the previous, hold on. The myth is related to the previous one about burials in the wrong place. Some headstones face east while others face west. The stone is usually, uh, hold on, the stone is usually placed facing the closest roadway so people can read the names on the headstone from their vehicle. Now, I will be very interested to see if that's true, because I'm sitting here thinking the last time I was a grave, which was not that long ago. I don't think that was true, but that doesn't mean anything, right? Um, anyways, let's just keep going. Not many people realize that, though, and some families freak out when it appears Aunt Bertha God, I can't believe you used that as a, a thing. Uh, should have been buried behind the headstone rather than in front of it. I see what he's saying. Here is the key. The headstone is always placed on the west end of the grave. This originates from the Christian belief that when Jesus Christ returns again, he will appear in the eastern sky and all of the dead will rise to meet him. In the United States, a person is traditionally buried with his or her head to the west. So when everyone rises out of the ground, they will be facing east to meet Christ. So the name headstone comes from placing the marker above the head 
of the deceased on the West End. If any of y'all know this off the top of your head, drop in the damn comments. I'm curious to know if that's true. Um, I've actually uncovered several so-called footstones at the East End of some very old graves. These are usually the size of a brick and were used to mark the end of the grave. They have gone out of fashion, partly because... Pardon me. It was the very it was very hard to keep the grass from growing over them. Okay, I get that. Myth. Uh, cemeteries are deathly still. Fact. They get quite noisy at times. The the heavy machinery we can use can cause quite a ruckus. I realize the noise often irritates visitors, but sometimes our work just can't wait. Such a situation brought about one of the more peculiar requests I ever received. While digging a grave, I saw a woman park her car and wander through the cemetery. She kept pushing, I don't know, she kept pausing to peer up into the trees and I couldn't figure out what she was doing. Finally, she marched right at me and signaled for me to turn off the backhoe. She then shouted, can't you turn that thing off? This is supposed to be a place of solitude. My bird watching club is coming here in an hour and you scared off all the cock -a doodle and doodle birds. I apologize, but explained that my top priority was preparing a grave rather than accommodating the birds. She huffed and said, maybe you should change your priorities. She stomped away and I quickly fired the backhoe engine up again. The bird watchers didn't have much success that day. I mean, and, and again, I get some of the scenarios he paints with the, and describe, I can 100% see a person doing that, right? And going and being like all up in it about bird watching and thinking like they're entitled to that, right? And acting that way over that. And I can 100% see him having the attitude of, yeah, I ruined their day. I don't think it would take him much to get pleasure out of ruining others' days. He's already shown us that, right? He gets these like weird pleasure out of, but number one, the power over others. But number two, like he gets off in these weird, like aggressions towards other people. Like remember the whole little story about changing the light, which there's no way I believe that story. Remember the woman who said that she would go there and sit in the car and read from the floodlight, but he changed it. And then like she, her husband came to be like, will you put it back so she can read? And it didn't even make sense because there's so many other ways you could use the light, right? But it was like, and then he's like, I never moved that light. And it's like, you know, why would you get off on that, right? It's the same kind of thing right here. Although if somebody talked to me that way, I'd be like, you know what? I'm going to wait for the damn bird watching club to come over and I'm going to fire the damn back co op. Make it probably damn backfire if you come at me that way. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. That's, that's damn right. You know, but. That would be, you know, if I had good reason to or whatever. I'm just saying. Anyways, let's keep going. But first, I got to take a sip of water. Let me just kind of go off camera here for this. Okay. Okay. Anyways, next one. Myth. Where you buy a burial plot. Hold on. When you buy a burial plot, you own it and can do whatever you wish with the property. Fact. You are leasing the property from the cemetery. Yeah, I mean, I would never think that, right? I would never think I owned that, right? Uh, buying a burial plot is really just a lease. You aren't likely to get evicted from your grave. Can you imagine? Um, but you can't build a shack on the property or plant a garden. I'm going to come back to that because I have questions. Uh, in fact, most cemeteries have strict guidelines on headstones and plantings. Some don't allow elevated headstones or bushes at all. This is mainly because of the need to get the heavy equipment in for future burials. If someone plants a large bush on a grave, it turns into a big obstacle if we have to bury someone nearby. We likely have to pull out the bush. This makes sense to me, right? Uh, some people still have, some people still push the rules though. One lady kept planting cherry trees on her husband's grave despite our continual explanations that it was against the cemetery rules. We would remove the trees, but she on a continued planting new ones and then wrote a scathing letter about us to the local paper. We just kept removing the trees, though, and after two years, she finally gave up. Okay, so here's my question, and this is for people who don't live in the United States. Is that different than other there? Because that's my understanding here. And I mean, I could be wrong. He could be lying. I mean, shocker. Um, but my understanding here is like, I mean, yeah, there are rules what you can do on that. And what's making me think about that is I'm going back to, wait, that was something different. Never mind. Is that the case in other countries and whatnot in regards to cemeteries? Is that how that works? Um, 
I'm just curious for anybody who might have intel on that. So anyways, let's keep going. <clears throat> Pardon me. So the next thing, myth. If you fall on a grave, you'll never get out. Fact, most graves are only five feet deep. This has got to be a shoddy attempt at humor. Please, God, help us. As I mentioned in the first chapter, we don't dig graves deeper than we have to. If you're in decent shape, you could hoist yourself out of a grave. The traditional belief is different, of course, because people want to think a grave is really deep. One of my favorite scenes from the animated TV show The Simpsons is when Homer falls into a grave and he appears up from its bottom. That grave is about 20 feet deep. It is certainly easier to draw a hole. Hold on. It is certainly easier to draw a hole that that deep than to dig one. That grave would have taken forever to dig. We actually climbed down into each newly dug grave to level out the bottom and square off the sides so the vault will fit. It would really bother one of the employees to climb down in there, but he finally told himself it's just a hole, not a grave, until a body is in it. How true. So creepy to hear him say that. And he reminds me now that he, him aligning himself with the Simpsons or that, I'm like, he is like, he reminds me of a character from there. It's so weird to hear him talk about that. I'm like, this thing, things are like clicking. Okay, so that's, shockingly, y'all, that's that chapter. I can't believe we're now going to get into two chapters in one video. I'm, I'm excited about this. This is refreshing, right? Okay, so chapter six, Outfoxing the Grim Reaper. I think we'll all agree the movie Bill and Ted's Bogus Adventure isn't Keanu Reeves' best film, but I did enjoy when Bill and Ted were forced to defeat Death, also known as the Grim Reaper. After being killed, Bill and Ted refused to accept their fate. Instead, they challenged Death to various games, such as Battleship and Twister, and they win every time, thus they beat Death. This is very creepy and bizarre hearing him talk about this. Let's, I'm curious to see where he's going with this. Uh, in real life, I often wonder if death isn't still playing games in another realm. Oh my god, y'all, did I not just say that? And then here we go. Um, I love this recent story from London, England. You know he wrote the entire story off. Here we go. On the morning of Bob Talley's 100th birthday, he read a congratulatory telegra telegram from Queen Elizabeth and said, Yes, I made it. Then he promptly died. But his sudden departure didn't dampen the celebration. Family, friends, and the staff at his nursing home in southeast London went ahead with with the party as Bob lay dead in his bed, British newspapers reported. It was a bit of a shock when Uncle Bob died on the morning of his birthday, said... Barbara Barwell, Tally's niece, but everyone was turning up to the party. It was great. Everyone was dancing with each other and reading his uh, cards with him lying there. He knew he had reached 100, and I think he relaxed and just let go. Buckingham Palace was quoted as saying it was glad Tally had received the telegram. Of course, it is very sad to learn that he died so shortly afterward, a palace official said. The next, this is creepy, y'all. This this chapter might, like, really creep us out. The next, like, header or whatever is called Cosmic Clockwork. Okay, here we go. My, can you tell I need to be wearing my glasses? God help us. Okay, we've, we've probably all heard the phrase that deaths come in threes. There might be some truth to that. Burials do come in strange patterns. One section of the cemetery might go two months without a burial, then suddenly there will be three in that section within a week. I wish burials were predictable, but at least the law of averages does come into play. At the end of the year, our burial total was usually within a few weeks of the previous year. For that reason, I would get antsy in several days, if several days passed without a burial, because it meant a rush was coming. Over, But over the years, I only had one guarantee. There would be a burial at the exact time as my wife's monthly hair appointment. Oh, this is creepy to be talking about, Tammy. Um, okay, she could schedule her hair appointment three weeks in advance and arrange for me to watch the kids, but it was like signing someone's death warrant. Someone might have been happy and healthy when the appointment was made, but by the time my wife arrived at the hair salon, the person would have died, with the funeral scheduled exactly when my wife needed me home. It happened... It happened so often that she stopped bothering with me watching the kids during the appointment. They just went to Grandma's house. Teaming up is the next section. I knew I was really in trouble when Mother Nature and the Grim Reaper got together. Some winters, there would be several sunny days in a row without a burial. But if a major storm was headed our way, that was when the Grim Reaper's vacation ended and burial orders started pouring in. Where was he when the weather was nice? Getting a tan? <laughs> 
<laughs> I mean, it's just my God. Okay, so now this part is underlined in the book, so I find that interesting. Let's see why. Our November, oh, hold on, one November, the temperature suddenly dropped in the mid 50s to below zero within hours. Is that possible? I don't know. Anyways, maybe that's why I underlined. Anyways, um, one November, the temperature suddenly dropped from the mid 50s to below zero within hours. There wasn't any snow to insulate the ground, and everything was completely frozen within two days. Naturally, we received a burial order for that weekend. I found <clears throat> I found the burial plot, and the ground was rock hard. I couldn't even make a dent with a shovel. There, things were looking desperate. Then I did something I wouldn't recommend at home. I took a five gallon can of gasoline and completely soaked the burial plot. Y'all, I cannot with this, okay? And where we go. Then I stepped back and tossed a match on it. Three foot high flames instantly erupted. I fried my eyebrows, but I was so cold I didn't care. A car slowly drove by and I waved at the stunned driver. That certainly wasn't typical cemetery maneuver, but it worked. The flames burned away all the grass and warmed up the soil enough that I could finally get a shovel into the ground. If anybody knows, I don't know what you call it, dirt science, or whatever, Please help us. I mean, is this even possible? It doesn't even make sense. My first thing is this. Is it possible for the temperatures to drop that drastically? Like, it without being catastrophic. Like, to me, I'm just like, don't they make movies about this? Like, the day after tomorrow and something. You know what I'm saying? Where it's like it does that, but it causes, like, the entire earth to implode or something. And so then if the ground is that frozen, I mean, does it matter if you light it on fire? Like, isn't the ground beneath that frozen? Again, I ain't no scientist, okay? He could be telling the truth here, but because it's coming from his mouth... Anyways, let's go on to the next header. God help us here. Putting people in the right place. Man, I can't roll my eyes hard enough at this damn man. People often ask how I knew where to bury people. The cemetery is actually designed very precisely, and every burial plot has its own address. I just had to find that address using maps and small markers in the ground that few people even notice. Once I had found the location, I took a special piece of plywood that is cut in the shape of a grave and placed it on the grass. I would then cut around the board with a shovel, remove the grass, and put it aside to replace it later. Then I would dig the actual grave with the backhoe. When an adjoining burial spot was already filled, I used a thin metal rod called a probe to locate the nearby vault. I would push the probe down, on, down into the soil, and with a little practice, I could tell if it was hitting a vault. A rock or nothing at all. That way we avoided digging up anything we shouldn't. Okay, this is, you know, whatever. Okay, so the next section is called Special Days. Cemetery occupants receive more attention on some holidays than others. Of course, families tend to visit a person's grave on his or her birthday, but it was surprising to see which holidays generated visitors while other holidays went ignored. Now we're going to kind of go through where he lists these holidays out here. So he starts with New Year's Day. Uh, I worked on this holiday a few times to dig graves for funer four funerals arriving on January 2nd. It was completely dead out there. I mean, I can see this, right? Mar <clears throat> Pardon me. Martin Luther King Day. Not a whole lot of action at the cemetery. Valentine's Day. This one is a biggie. I tried to have the Christmas decorations cleaned off by February 1st because that's when the pink heart balloons started showing up. By Valentine's Day, the cemetery was covered in hearts, which was actually kind of nice. Now, side note, I never thought about this, but when you put stuff on people's graves, I always thought that I never knew that they came by and got that stuff. You know what I'm saying? Like, I thought that you would get it the next time you were there, but I never knew that. Uh, interesting. Anyways. President's Day. Not much celebrating going on. Just a lot of people coming to reach here to retrieve their plastic hearts. Okay. Um, it is, it is a popular day to hold a funeral, though, since a lot of people are off work. St. Patrick's Day. Surprisingly, this one is huge. By the second week of March, there are paper leprechauns and plastic clovers everywhere. Green tinsel is also popular. Easter. This holiday is fairly low-key. Some of the infant graves will have plastic Easter eggs. Oh, that's so sad. Or an Easter basket. Oh my god. Um, but this day isn't as popular as at the graveyard as you would think. People probably feel the cemetery crew would just eat the candy eggs and jelly beans, which very well could happen. I mean, why would you put that in there? I would not even think that. Right? I mean, I'm glad. Let us know, though, right? Um, okay. 
Arbor Day. This holiday near the end of April encourages tree conservation. It might not even be on your calendar, but each year a scout troop or civic group would plant a tree or two at the cemetery on this day. That's a nice gesture. Mother's Day. This is one of the biggest days of the year at the cemetery. A single rose is a popular item to place in the grave. Of course, I didn't have to do much cleanup because the old ladies in town had stolen the flowers by the following week. I can't <laughs> if you put that in there he is just a bitter queen y'all i'm talking a bitter damn queen i mean my god i mean you would have thought that was one of my damn one-liners okay you would have thought it was one of my one-liners i'm not joking it's plain as day right right up in there y'all it's right up in there okay let's keep going Memorial Day. I mean, this guy, I swear to God, y'all, this guy is crazy. Okay, Memorial Day. Uh, the granddaddy of them all, this one is, is a sextant's Thanksgiving. Christmas and New Year's all, hold on, Christmas and New Year's Eve all rolled into one. It's like inviting the whole town over for a party and letting them inspect every nook and cranny of your house. We spent several weeks in preparation. I usually get, hold on, I usually get, vib, hold on. I usually get pretty stressed. Hold on, please hold. My God, let me gather myself up. For some reason, I don't know if it's me or the sentence. No, I usually got pretty stressed out about it, but then it was over for another 12 months. We started removing the flowers and decorations a week later, and it took us three full days to clear the headstones. The majority of Americans visit a cemetery on this weekend, although most of them do so on the preceding Friday or Saturday so they can spend a few days at the beach rather than hanging out at a family gravesite. Who can blame them? Father's Day. This day typically has a weak, huh, a weak turnout. I know people truly love their fathers, but they don't feel like coming out to the cemetery again less than a month after Memorial Day. Besides, many people prefer to go boating instead. I'm sure that's what Dad would have wanted them to do. This is probably very true, right? Uh, Independence Day. This is an abundance of pre-holiday. There, oh no, there is an abundance of pre-holiday activity, with plenty of U.S. flags and colorful patriotic decorations placed on the graves. But on the Fourth of July, the visitors are so sparse you could sprint naked to the cemetery and no one would notice you. I don't encourage that. Uh, again, again, you know, he hasn't made a sexual or nudity type reference in a while. I'll give him that. But we're kind of right back there, right? The, the imagery of any kind of nudity and sex in the cemetery. He seems to like this, right? Okay. So, August. No holidays. Just the dog days of summer. If you want to see some unmotivated, lethargic teenage workers, go to the cemetery. August was always a long month for me. Honestly, I can't imagine digging a grave. I don't care if it was a damn back or what in the middle of August. Can you imagine? Uh, Labor Day. This one slips by unnoticed because the nation's marketing geniuses still haven't found a way to commercialize it. Until they do, cemeteries will remain quite bare in September. Columbus Day. Nope. Nope, not a big one either. I keep waiting for replicas of the Nina, Nina, Nina Pinta and Santa Maria to appear on graves, but this holiday, hold on, but they never showed up. I personally enjoyed this holiday for several reasons. The hot summer was over, my teenage workers were done for the year and wouldn't return until March, and Memorial Day was more than seven months away. Life was good. Halloween, shh, shh, shh. Okay, this one is always a major holiday in terms of decorations. The cemetery is filled with orange and black items. Many people put actual pumpkins next to the headstones. Imagine that. Most of these items are placed there several days before the holiday, though. The day itself is very quiet at the cemetery, and the police patrol it heavily that night to scare away the vandals. I had to dig a few graves on Halloween. I'm pretty thick-skinned, but even I felt a bit strange working on that day. I'm not alone. One family had scheduled a burial that co coincided with Halloween, but when they realized what day it was, they waited until November 1st. The city held an employee costume day on Halloween. The, the city held an employee costume party on Halloween, and each year I dressed up as a ghost. After the party, I always had the urge to drive the backhoe around the cemetery while still in my ghost costume and wave to people on the nearby highway. My fellow city workers thought it would be hilarious, but the park superintendent said it would be in poor taste and could cause a traffic accident. Veterans Day. 
I thought this would be a big day, especially after the attention deceased veterans receive on Memorial Day, but this is a very quiet day. It is usually a cold, blustery day, which certainly has an effect. Our cemetery has a veterans memorial, and many veterans do stop by on this day, but other visitors are few and far between. I think it's another case of people thinking one uh, one visit a year is enough. Besides, there isn't a universal a Universal Veterans Day decoration on the market, although small American flags do appear next to some veterans' headstones. Thanksgiving. If turkeys were looking for a place to blend in before the holiday, the cemetery would be the spot to hide. There are turkey decorations everywhere. People also like to have, bring branches of autumn leaves and place them on the graves. But the day itself is quiet. It was one of the few days I could be assured there wouldn't be a funeral. The only one, the only other days I could count on never having a burial was Memorial Day, Christmas Day, and New Year's Day. Any other holiday is open for burials, depending on how odd the family is. Christmas Day. This one ranks right behind Memorial Day in terms of decorations. There are also a surprising number of visitors on this day, even if it is snowing. Wreaths are the main decoration of choice, although many full-size Christmas trees show up on gravesites. Fake wrapped presents are also popular, but those tend to turn into soggy cardboard pulp by Christmas Day and aren't recommended. You know he walks around and stomps on them. Better to the damn core. New Year's Eve. It isn't an official holiday, but it's a very popular day for funeral. If someone dies between December 25th and 29th, you can be assured the funeral will be on December 31st. Families seem to want to get their relative in the ground, then drink and dance their way into a new year. You know, out with the old, in with the new. Sounds fitting. For him, it does. Oh, okay. We are 60% into the book. We are we're nearing finish. We are getting there. God help us. Yeah, this guy's absolutely nuts. I mean, I say this and everything. Again, you're seeing this bitterness come through, this power over people, you know, this, the, the, the poor taste and comedic stuff that he does. You know, and again, I don't know which of these stories are true, which ones he just plagiarized and pretend that happened to him, the whole nine yards. But it's also creepy to go read. He puts so much fake concern into being a sexton in the grave and this higher authority on this. But then look at what he did, right? I mean, you scratch me at the surface and it's like this monster just comes out. And all these horrifying things that he did. But allegedly convincing himself and others that, oh, it's all in the name of this and that and the other. I mean, just absolutely makes me sick to my damn stomach right it's just it's so pathetic right so the next the name of the next shot we're gonna be going over cemetery blunders god help us right god help us and here we go my crew works around heavy machinery every day but we do our best to stay safe i'm grateful none of us have ever been carted off to the emergency room but we've had some close calls uh, the title thing here is uh the subtitle okay try going forward now it's hard to call this first incident a blunder. It was a disaster, plain and simple. Sometimes we must, pr may we must park our dump trunk. Hold on. Sometimes we must park our dump trunk in precarious places when digging graves because of obstacles such as trees and headstones. In this case, we had to park the dump truck with the back tires only two feet from the grave. We successfully dug the grave and I pulled the backhoe out of the way as my young co-worker Richard hopped into the dump truck to drive away. Then I witnessed something I'd only seen in my nightmares. Instead of going forward, Richard accidentally threw the truck in reverse. Bum, bum, bum. Within moments, we had a completely full dump truck at the bottom of a grave with the truck's front end jutting straight into the sky. Then the soil in the dump truck spilled out and refilled the hole, burying the back half of the truck. Whoa, uh, 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 uh. I glanced at Richard, who was still behind the wheel, although he was now reclined back as if he were ready for a space shuttle launch. His eyes were gigantic, and he was literally speechless. I jumped out of the backhoe and helped him down. He finally said, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Two hours later, with the use of a second backhoe and several strong chains, we somehow pulled the dump truck out of that grave and started over. The next one's called, Who Ordered the Swimming Pool? 
This, uh, there is a part of our cemetery where the soil is basically clay. You could make some great pottery with it, and I've discovered how it holds water pretty well. The part of me, I had to catch my breath for a second, took my breath away. It took my breath away. Anyways, uh, one evening we dug a grave in that area for a funeral the following day. The next morning I wasn't prepared for what greeted me when I checked to see if the grave was still okay. There was water all the way to the top of the grave. It was now a mini lake. We had unknowingly cracked a sprinkler line while digging the grave, and during the night the water had steadily filled the hole, with the funeral due to arrive in less than two hours. This was one of the few times when I nearly just hopped in my truck and took off to Mexico. But I got a bucket and started bailing and bailing and bailing. Of course, I reached a point where, I'd actually, where I actually had to get in the hole to remove the rest of the water. I took off my boots, slid into the hole, and sunk in the mud up to my knees with water up to my waist. <sighs> But I nearly had all the water out when the vault guy showed up. He walked up to my, he walked up to the hole, looked at my mud-covered body, took a puff on his cigarette, and simply said, "Whoa." He put a plank down the hole, down into the hole, so I could climb out. The grave had somehow held its shape pretty well, and with the funeral's arrival now less than an hour away, I told the vault guy, "Let's put your vault in." Is it just me, this Paul? There's something that, and I don't know, I mean, for whatever reason, I feel like I'm reading a dirty romance novel. I mean, is it just me? Is it all the whole talk or something? I don't know. Like, am I channeling the loin fires or something? Or I don't, and like the slit in the mud. I don't know. Maybe it's just too early in the morning, but I don't know. It's just, it's extra creeping me out this morning for some reason. Please hold. Let's put your vault in. I mean, I don't know. Anyways, um, he started to protest, but then he just shrugged and said, whatever, dude. I mean, you see where I'm going with this? Now, I'm not going to... Now, this whole reading is now tainted, right? This entire reading is now tainted. But we have to ask this because he has, like, woven this, like, stuff into this book, right? Anyways, um... That vault sunk more than two feet into the mud, but it didn't overflow, and once the planks and astroturf were in place, it looked fine. The family never suspected a thing, and I exhaustedly... up oh, there we go, exhaustedly. If you're drinking, take a shot. I'll have some coffee. So, if you're new here, we drink every time he uses an adverb, which is, like, basically almost every other word. I'm just kind of surprised we've only... We've just hit this... Uh, exhaustedly. That's a that's a good one right there. Uh, so the family never suspected a thing, and I exhaustedly host myself off at the other end of the cemetery. And yes, we fixed the sprinkler line later that day. So here's an example. The family never suspected a thing, and I exhaustedly host myself off at the other end of the cemetery. Now, just basic one-on-ones up here. This is what I might have said. The family never suspected a thing, period. I host myself off at the other end of the cemetery, um, period. Uh, I, I bent over, I, I'm literally making this up on the fly in my head, you know, I bent over with my hands on my knees and let out one long, uh, sigh of breath, you know, as I rested or something like that. Anything else besides the word exhaustedly, right? There's another way you can describe this word. This is just called cheap writing, you know, exhaustedly. It's just, there's so much more better ways to describe something and to also take a moment to get more in scene and do all this kind of stuff, but whatever, I mean, I Let's keep going. Uh, the next little title is Shade in Strange Places. I loved working with older employees who mow lawns. No, I loved working with the older employees who mow the lawns. But I naturally watched their health situations closely. Nothing would be worse than having a cemetery employee die while he's on the job. Ugh. On my very first day of work at the cemetery, I met Reed, one of the riding mower operators. We chatted for a moment, and then he drove off on his mower. The heat was brutal that day, and I returned to our office that afternoon to get a drink. Then I noticed Reed's mower sitting out in the middle of the cemetery, and I could see him laying motionless next to it. Oh no, I thought. Reed has died. I ran to his side, and he really did look dead. I kicked him gently in the ribs with a with cobra-like speed, he grabbed my foot. Uh, and with cobra-like speed, he grabbed my foot. We're going to talk about that in a second. Um, I felt a mixture of relief and embarrassment as he snarled. What in the world are you doing? I quickly learned Reed took a nap. Took a nap each afternoon in the middle. Of, hold on. And the shade. Wait, hold on, y'all. This is. 
I quickly learned Reed took a nap each afternoon in the shade of his mower and he didn't appreciate being kicked. I, I mean, again, look, I mean, this is, this is what I'm talking about. This is why these little microaggressions, if you will. This is why this is interesting. So his first thought was he's dead. And his first thought was to kick the body. Now, this is not like some... Okay, this is the... Friday the 13th, right? You think you've killed Jason. That is a body I would anticipate you might... First of all, you just run the other way in that scenario, right? You don't just stick around and see if you killed Jason. But if you need to keep the continuity going for part five or six, this is a scenario where you might just kick Jason to see if he's dead, right? This is acceptable, okay? Your co-worker, your elderly co-worker who is mowing the yard, who is laying on the ground next to the mower, you go up and you kick in the side. And I mean, even if it's just a light kick, why would that be your first reaction? I mean, why would that be like a, not a read to get on your knee, like Pat read? Yeah, I'm doing this motion with my hand as if I'm touching his back. These are the things that he shows through. And again, this wasn't like he just wrote this yesterday. This was, I think, years ago, right? These are the things, this is what lies beneath. You know, I'm gonna use that movie title. This shows me who he is beneath the surface, right? No respect for the dad. No respect for the dad. This is uh, somebody who he thought was dead, right? Uh, somebody a decent, who he, I'm assuming he thinks is a decent person. He talks nicely of him. He doesn't talk too nicely of any people, but Anyways, let's keep going. Okay, so the next little subsection is called Where's My Truck? Okay, uh, here we are. Reed provided another memorable moment later that summer as we were getting ready to go home. He was standing near our equipment shed with a perplexed look on his face. Hey, did one of you guys move my truck? He asked us. I parked it here after lunch and now it's gone. It was literally nowhere to be found, and then I spotted it, nearly a quarter mile away at the bottom of the cemetery, nestled against our lower fence. He first thought it was a prank, but we soon realized that Reed had left the truck in neutral, and it had made a long, graceful backward journey through the cemetery. We followed the entire, the, wait, hold on, we followed the tire tracks, and that, hold on, we followed the tire tracks, and that empty vehicle somehow passed through dozens of headstones and trees without hitting a single one. It is too bad it hadn't happened while a funeral was going on. News, wait, it is too bad it hadn't happened while a funeral was going on. News reports of the ghost truck would have certainly been in the papers all across the country. I mean, I guess maybe amongst people who work in that industry, that would be funny. I mean, my first thought is, what if it hit somebody? You know, and I'm being extra judgmental because it's Chad, right? Maybe my normal dark sense of humor might have found that funny. But again, my first thought was that uh, that could have hit, wait, what? Anyways, uh, maybe it's too early in the morning. So, so far I'm reading, like, this is like an undercover, like, gay romance novel or whatever. And then I'm also, like, just being, like, highly critical, right? Like, any little thing he does, I'm just like, well, that could have harmed somebody. But again, I just think with him, this just kind of goes to show where I'm like, the, I just don't think this guy has any respect for human life. I, I mean, obviously, right? We know this. But, like, back when he was supposed to, right? Before, like, this monster version of him was finally shown to be what it was. So, anyways. Uh, the next thing is called, What Did You Say? What did you say? Sorry, I break out in the song a lot of times. <laughs> it drives me crazy. <laughs> okay, please help. Let me get some coffee. This is I've shown you all this one before, but this is one of my coffee cups. We got this in, uh, where is this from? Blowing Rock. Just a beautiful place if you've never been. God's country up there is what I like to call it. Okay. So, here we go. One morning after digging a grave, I climbed out of the back hoe and heard my coworker. His name is Dick. I mean, y'all, that's it. This is an undercover book. I mean, I can't make this up. God help us if this has sexual in innuendos in it. I'm 100% convinced at this point. Okay. So, I climbed out of the back hoe and heard my coworker, Dick, yell something. I hurried around the front end of the back hoe to see what was wrong, and a flash of silver caught my eye. Instantly, a searing pain shot through my leg, and a sharp shovel clanked away. Dick had thrown the shovel, and now he let out a very apologetic curse. We quickly examined my leg, which had been sliced open by the shovel blade. <laughs> Even through my Levi's, I didn't need stitches, but I still carry a caught scar today. Once it was obvious I would survive, um, I asked Dick what he had shouted. He shook his head and muttered, for here it comes. 
what again i can't it's yo lesson learned here i think it's just because uh, my time right now it's like not even eight o'clock i mean i just y'all help me out here <laughs> just can't with this okay i cannot anyways okay the next section is called snow blind and i'm sorry if you can hear my stomach starting to rumble okay so funerals are usually scheduled without regard for the weather uh so on a day when i had two funerals coming at noon i found myself in a blizzard that had dumped 14 inches of snow on the cemetery overnight with more coming down the road was already impassable for a typical car yet i had to clear a way for vault trucks and hearses to make it to the burial site i should have just put use the backhoe bucket yo there comes, there comes the rejection, the rejection. My body is, uh, the first rejection comes in at the timer says 15 minutes and 13 seconds. My, my body, my spirit, my mind, my, my psyche is like, we, we reject this demon. <laughs> we expel this demon from our hemisphere. <laughs> okay, here, let's start over. I was really trying to suppress the yawn too. <laughs> okay. So, I should have just used the backhoe bucket to clear a path, but I chose to use the snow plow. Both funerals were in a fairly steep part of the cemetery, and I figured I was just, I figured I just got going downhill. Hold on. And I figured if I just got going downhill, the snow plow would clear a good initial path, and it did until I missed a turn. It was snowing so hard I couldn't tell where I was until I felt a horrible bump, a headstone. I plowed over two more headstones before I finally got the snow plow stopped. I was 30 feet off the road and really stuck. This would sure look good to the funeral participants. The next three hours were a blur as I used the backhoe to clean off the most essential roadways. The, the truck could wait despite how embarrassing it would be. But once I got the grave shoveled off and ready to go, the vault guys showed up. And when they saw the truck, they gave their usual sympathetic condolences such as, that's totally awesome. They're going to fire you, dude. I did my best to ignore them and return my attention to the truck. It was much more than I could handle myself, so I had to call the superintendent, who wasn't too pleased with me. Well, call the mayor. God knows. Call the mayor. He had plenty of other snow-related problems to deal with, but he also didn't want to have a picture of that truck in the local paper. So through several tricky maneuvers, using chains and two black backhoes, we literally lifted that truck truck over several headstones and back onto the road. It was quite an engineering feat and the falling snow covered up the worst damage by the time the funerals arrived. It took an entire day to patch things up though, though, once the snow melted the following spring. Okay, so again, if anybody out there in the business or whatever, is this, this whole fat thing that he comes up with worried about being in the press and every little thing that goes wrong as if he's damn Michael Jackson with the paparazzi waiting on him. Is this true? If you did something like this, would this be in the papers everywhere? And maybe it's like dependent on the town you live in. Like it doesn't sound like, like anything was going on in this town. So if like, you know, Aunt Wilma sneezed wrong or something like that, they would feature this on the front damn page. Yeah, if she burnt her damn green bean casserole, that would be front page news. You know what I'm saying? Like, I mean, I get that it's different or whatever, but with Chad's narcissism, hold on, I'm looking for my water. Uh, with Chad's narcissism, it just seems like every little thing relates back to him, the mayor, and the press, right? Um, so there's that. I don't know where my water is, so we'll just keep going, but let me take a little sip of coffee here. Now, the next section is called Heads Up. Okay, he says, I had no control over this close call. My signal that a funeral would soon arrive was when the mortuary's flower band showed up, bringing all the memorial wreaths and decorations to the grave. I usually waited in a shady place until, where is it, until the van arrived. Then I held the mortician and arranged the flowers around the grave. On this particular day, I was waiting under a large maple tree along our main cemetery road. When the flower van arrived, I ran across the cemetery as usual to help unload the decorations. Five minutes later, we saw the hearse drive into the cemetery. I was surprised when it stopped suddenly. Near the maple tree, the driver gave a short honk and then I ran to see what was wrong. A 10 inch thick, a 10 inch thick limb had fallen from the tree right where I'd been standing. It now blocked the road and I dragged it out by 
I dragged it out of the way so the funeral procession could pass by. Then I thanked my lucky stars I had moved before the limb fell. They would have been soon holding my funeral if that limb had hit me on the head. The next section's called Down for the Count. This next incident sounds like an urban myth, but unfortunately I saw it with my very own eyes. This means he, he, he plagiarized it. Um, I'm sure it happened to someone. At this point, we can tell a lot of this stuff probably happened to somebody, but he most likely played tries it. Um, as Paul Bear has approached a grave, the mortician, if it's a damn story about a girl carrying a baby down the damn road and then she disappears in the back seat, I'm done, okay? He can he has probably recycled that damn story a hundred times over. Anyways, as Paul Bear has approached a grave, the mortician usually grasps the casket's front handle and guides it over the hole. This helps the Paul Bears get the casket centered over the grave. On this occasion, everything was going smoothly until the mortician placed his foot next to the grave and then vanished. Oh my god, I would have died. The mortician, that's a little humor there, I would have died. <laughs> uh, he didn't say that, that was me. Um, the mortician was suddenly chest deep in the hole and he almost pulled the casket down on himself. The vault guy had neglected to put a plank across the end of the grave. The crowd gave the appropriate oohs and ahs as the pallbearers somehow kept their footing and saved the mortician from being smashed by the casket. Two men grabbed his hands and pulled him out and he quickly regained his composure. I thought he showed true class when he smiled at the pallbearers and said, gentlemen, watch that first step. Then the crowd chuckled and the mortician quickly stepped away once the casket was safely in place. I then joined him as he marched 50 yards up the road to where the vault guy was parked. The mortician kept his tone low to avoid being overheard, but let's just say he wasn't nearly as gracious to the vault guy as he had been in front of the crowd. Nice shoes is the name of the next section. We have occasional mishaps involving older graves that were dug prior to 1940 because concrete vaults weren't used as often before then. One time we had completed a grave, uh, but as we pulled, but as we pulled the backhoe away, one wall caved in and revealed a small cavern. Ooh, that'd be creepy. Uh, in the opening, I could see two fancy leather shoes. I realized the cavern was actually the end of a rotted coffin. I grabbed a small piece of plywood and we covered that hole right up. That's the end. The next section is called Aging Acrobat. One of our mower guys, Dick, here we go back with Dick again. Uh, how, how has he been doing? We haven't seen him in a couple of pages. Uh, he operated a headstone company in his younger days. Over the years, Dick leaned, learned every trick in the book on how to move monstrous headstones. I called him the Leverage King. Can't roll my eyes hard enough. And he would have given the builders of the Egyptian pyramids a run for their money. We straightened up some huge stones using only a pair of crowbars. When Dick wasn't there, though, moving headstones didn't go smoothly. During Dick's summer vacation, I had to move a huge stone for a burial. Another one of our mower guys, Kelly, offered me a hand, and we had the stone positioned just about where we wanted it. When we were nearly finished, Kelly sat on the end of the crowbar to hold up the stone, the stone up. As I removed the straps, we placed we had placed under the stone, but suddenly the stone shifted, and I saw Kelly zoom past me as if he were Superman. I turned around to find Kelly sprawled on the top of a nearby bush. The immense weight of the headstone had won out, and that crowbar had catapulted Kelly nearly ten feet through the air. At least he had a soft landing. The Terrible Trench is the next section. Kelly helped me with a lot of tough jobs, from fixing cracked splinter, splink, sprinkler lines to digging graves in sub-zero weather. He has since pop passed away, and I'm sure he's happier now, but I will always remember his patience with me during our worst work day ever. As fate would have it, we had four funerals scheduled on the same day that Mother Nature dumped six inches of sleet on our cemetery. Then the sun came out, and soon our cemetery evolved into a slimy swamp. It was, it was difficult to even walk on the grass without sinking in a little bit. My head began to pound as I tried to figure out how we'd even, how do we ever fill these graves? I rolled out using the dump truck. It would have sunk to the axles immediately. I gambled and decided to use the backhoe in the first grave. It usually takes three loads of soil with the front end loader to fill a grave, and I managed to get the first two in by staying on a path of wooden planks Kelly had created, but by the third load, the planks were breaking up and were smashed three inches into the ground. In retrospect, I should have stopped them, but I knew we had three more funerals arriving soon. So I tried to dump in that last load. 
Crack! Those planks just disintegrated, and I felt the backhoe sinking quickly. I was up to the axles in mud within seconds, and I think I only stopped because the tires were resting on top of the burial vaults. I tried to move backward, but I just buried my tires even deeper. I finally hopped out, and Kelly and I were stunned. It looked impossible to escape from the mud pit. We considered just leaving the backhoe there until things dried out, which might have taken at least a week, but then we imagined the complaints we'd get, so we tried everything to extract the backhoe, but without success. Finally, I decided to just literally dig myself out. I put my front bucket flat and used the backhoe scoop to save myself. I repeatedly extended the arm and dug in as deep as I could, then pulled the backhoe a few inches closer to the paved road. This worked with one small problem. I was digging a two foot deep trench across 18 graves. After several minutes, I finally reached the pavement. I can't adequately describe the destruction I had caused. I had partially buried some headstones and exposed two vaults. Kelly and I were terribly embarrassed and spread big tarps over the whole mess. We thankfully finished the other funerals with minimal damage. I then spent the next two weeks hauling in dirt with a wheelbarrow and laying new grass to restore the area I had destroyed. I waited for a visitor to complain, but I didn't hear a word, probably because it had happened in January in one of the cemetery's least visited sections. The three months later, a lady called me. She said, it looks like my husband's headstone has sunk a little. Can you raise it? I happily, oh God, there we go. I happily agreed to level it up for her, period. So, I agreed to level it up for her, period, smiling into the phone. Something like that, right? I mean, I'm not trying to sound like I'm a literary genius, but I mean, you see where I'm going with this, right? I neglected to mention that her particular headstone had been buried under two feet of mud a few months earlier. I almost hadn't been able to find it, but all is well that ends well, right? I love how he just gets that little naughty boy thing, right, of like that, you know... Again, the big takeaways from this thing are he is a monster. I think that this was giving like low key, down low romance novel vibes. Yeah, I just, again, I come, I, you know, in all seriousness, you just get a little bit more insight into how he views people. And I just, I think he has no respect. My big takeaway was him claiming to kick his coworker, his elderly coworker. He's like, oh, I like the older people. He was in there, so I gave him a kick on the ribs. I mean, why, really? You know what I'm saying? It's just those little things right that That's who Chad is. That's who he really is. He's telling you who he is with that. So chapter eight is surviving the survivors. God help us. So here we go. Most people don't even think about a cemetery during a typical day. But there are others who become almost obsessed by it. First damn line. Okay, y'all. First damn line. Or is it a compulsion? Either way, there are many cemetery visitors who are there every single day, and some stop by several times a day. He 100% would stop by several times a day. Although it is a weird habit, I can sympathize with these people. The cemetery is where someone very dear to them is buried, and they are struggling through life without the one who has passed away. This is just... And, and right after I said that whole thing just now. Anyways, th then it says, Watch the Road for Wayne. My first experience with this psh, obsession came in the form of Wayne, a very old man who drove an equally ancient pickup truck. Soon after his wife died, Wayne would come to the cemetery once or twice a day. But as he got older, his visits increased to once every hour while the sun was up. Out of curiosity, I once followed Wayne home during my lunch break. I nervously watched him barely avoid several collisions before pulling his truck into his driveway. I then went home and ate my lunch, but rather than going directly back to the cemetery, I parked near Wayne house. Sure enough, at 12.55, he climbed to his into his truck and headed to the cemetery, arriving right at 1 p.m. for his hourly visit. Wayne's vision sadly became steadily worse, and enough citizens complained about his driving that his license was taken away. Losing his license killed him, literally. He died within three months, and now he rests next to his beloved wife. You know Chad complained about him numerous times. And honestly, this is another example of why I put that story in there. I mean, again, like, oh, we all banded together and killed Wayne is what I got from this. And maybe I'm being just, like, extra sensitive. Place hold. But these are the stories that, like, why? Like, why put that in there? I mean, that's, like, trying to be a sweet, cute story. 
absolutely just loves pulling the carpet out from someone. Anyways, just checking up on things is the next one. <clears throat> Pardon me. For other obsessed people, I think they visit each day to make sure nothing has happened to their headstone. Of course, the odds are very slim that something will have happened since their visit the previous hour, but you'd be surprised. Well, I mean, my damn God, in his damn cemetery with the stories he's told us, anything is possible at any given damn moment, okay? I would probably be, if I didn't have anything to do, I'd check every 30 minutes because you could show up in the damn hole. The place would be rearranged, right? Anyways, one guy I'll call John had a three-hour routine going Okay, hold on. One guy I'll call John had a three-hour routine going to visit his wife's grave. He would come to the cemetery at 7 a.m., 10 a.m., and 1 p.m., 4 p.m., and 7 p.m., whether it was a blizzard or blistering hot. His truck was bigger than mine, so so if it snowed overnight, I would get there just after 7, just after 7 a.m. because Gary would have blazed a trail for me. Anyway, one year we hired a new fellow to operate one of the riding lawnmowers. Unfortunately, he had a hard time getting the hang of it, so I had him practicing, practice mowing a fairly easy section near John's wife's grave. He seemed to be handling it all right, so I left him alone to practice. Five minutes later, the new employee came running down the road. We've got a problem, he shouted, and I could see he had knocked John's headstone completely over, and the mower was now high-centered on it. See, this is what I'm talking about, right? Anything would go down there. We struggled to get the mower off the stone, but it was too heavy. I ran and got in the back and we lifted the mower off with a chain. The headstone was still a major problem, though. Miraculously... Do we count this one as a take us up miraculously? I mean, is that one uh, one of the adverbs? If you're new here, we do like to drink every time we use an adverb, which is quite often. We might like, well, we'll give them a pass on this one. Um, miraculously, it wasn't chipped or cracked, but it had a dark tire mark across it. I checked my watch. We only had 10 minutes until John's next visit. Dun dun dun. I knew John would explode if he saw what would happen to it, what happened to his headstone, but we lifted the stone back in place and got the tire mark scrubbed off in less than 10 minutes. I hopped in the backhoe just as John's truck pulled through the gate. I drove to the other end of the cemetery and watched as John got out, placed a flower on the grave, then got back in his truck to continue his three-hour cycle. He had no idea what had happened to his headstone. I mean, come on, y'all. Do we really believe this? You're going to know if that went down. I don't care if the damn tire marks on there or not. You're going to know if the damn headstone got ripped up like that. I mean, point blank, period. And I mean, I get... Oh my God. And if this is true, I'm sure there might be some people who do this, like you visit the gravesite and all that. How heartbreaking is that to be that heartbroken? You know what I'm saying? To come visit your loved one, to miss them that much, right? That's so sad. Um, anyways, so the next thing is called, Hey, you skipped Arbor Day. <clears throat> Pardon me. One aspect of this, okay, one aspect of this, hold on. It goes dark on me sometimes and my eyes are like, help, we're in our 40s. <laughs> can't adjust like that okay one aspect of this compulsive cemetery behavior i didn't understand was the need to decorate the grave for every minor event as i mentioned in chapter six decorating graves on major holidays is perfectly fine however some people take it to an outlandish level one lady went completely overboard when decorating her son's grave she brought little rockets on new year's day dozens of paper four leaf clovers on it wait she brought little rockets on new year's day Dozens of paper four-leaf clovers on St. Patrick's Day, and so forth. I sincerely doubt her son made a visit on, from heaven on every minor holiday to check out the newest decorations, but it allowed the woman to deal with her grief. I mean, my God. Again, why? Why feel the need to put this in writing like what a nasty thought to have about somebody right and even if you were thinking it like that's okay that's your own private thought i would not put that on paper and sell it in a book right but like if you were thinking like hey yeah god damn man we should bring some damn paper flowers you know that's your own private thought that's your own damn business right you're entitled to that right you don't put that out there like that um anyways that lady was hardly alone. During the first week of November, my main task was removing dozens, dozens of carved pumpkins off graves before they turned into slimy piles of mush. 
It seems to me that any dead people who are still floating around would be more inclined to scare people on Halloween, or at least hang out at a Halloween party than go to their grave sites to look at decorations. Well, let's just take the wind out of everyone's damn sail. Um, but I'll never forget the woman who drove her truck across several graves so she could throw out a hay bale to use as a Thanksgiving decoration on her mother's grave. The funny thing was that she saw me watching her, but she still did it before speeding off and leaving tire tracks across her own mother's grave. Yeah, I mean, this he's a bitter damn queen. He did this job... Okay, like, he was one of these queens where when he gave his two weeks notice, he needed to give it, like, two years prior, right? I mean, he was, like, done, okay? He needed to check out a while ago. Wow. Okay, spring skiing is next. The most creative decoration I ever saw, though, didn't come from a flower shop. We had buried a teenager who had loved snow skiing, and his family always kept his grave well decorated with ski-related items. But on the night before Memorial Day, I drove to the cemetery to check on things and found his uncles arriving with two heaping uh, truckloads filled with snow. They had gone deep into the mountains to find actual snow, and now they were shoveling it onto the lawn. Within an hour, they had constructed a mini ski slope next to their nephew's grave. I should hope that when I'm gone that somebody cared enough about my ass to do something like that. I mean, that's touching. You know what I'm saying? I mean, who do, I mean, this is, I mean, come on. This is amazing, right? Um, okay. It was nearly five feet high and eight feet long, and the family placed a little Ken and Barbie and ski gear at the top of the slope. It definitely caught the attention of every Memorial Day visitor that year. I didn't mind. It melted within five days and kept the grass green in that spot for a long time. You know, he I was I was waiting for him to say, and then we melted it with the exhaust on our cars as soon as he left. You know what I'm saying? Like that's like what I expect out of this monster. Okay. Even Disney isn't safe as the next thing. As I mentioned earlier, people are known to steal decorations off graves. Now, this has been confirmed by several Sofa Squad members here that this is a thing. Thank you for... I have learned so much about graveyard stuff from reading this and y'all confirming stuff. People who, like, actually know. Uh, because I don't trust anything he says. So, thank you. We are learning things. Um, so... It's a shame, but I wasn't surprised when a lady complained to me that the expensive two-foot-tall statues of Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck she put on her daughter's grave were missing. I had spotted them on the grave the previous day, knowing it was likely the last time I would see them. They probably looked really nice in an old lady's backyard, though. I mean, at this point, this is probably true, unfortunately. Are we sure God is a Lakers fan is the next one. Uh, some families have taken law enforcement into their own hands. One lady's son really loved the Los Angeles Lakers, and after his burial, she placed the Lakers memor memorabilia uh, all over his grave during the NBA season. When items started disappearing, disappearing, she naturally got irate. She then decided to enact the wrath of God on the thieves. She wrote a very threatening note, laminated it, then posted it next to the headstone. The note had a headline that said, The Lord will curse your soul if you steal from this grave. Not surprisingly, the next stolen item from the grave was the note itself. Okay, the next section are yeah, teddy bears, Bud Light, and Burn Bills. Uh, he got real creative with that one. He probably workshopped that title right there. Okay. I know teddy bears are adorable, but they don't belong on graves. Uh, the sprinklers soak them in the summer, and they're constantly wet in the winter. They start to smell like a wet dog and fall apart. I think it is for such reasons that most cemeteries usually remove any decorations one week after they were placed on the grave. I personally think that's a little hasty, and I didn't have the time to patrol each grave that closely. But I was continually removing some memorabilia... Memora, memorabilia... It's okay, whatever. Uh, from certain graves, one lucky dead guy mysteriously received. I just felt weird saying that, but that's what he wrote. Um, one lucky dead guy mysteriously received an open bottle of Bud Light on the last night of every month. When I spotted the new delivery on that grave each month, I always dumped out the beer and threw away the bottle. I didn't want to them. I didn't want someone to take a swig of it. You know, he totally drank it. Uh, for several years on one grave, we would find the charred remains of $20 bills. I would love to know the background of that story. Oh, well, it makes as much sense as playing the lottery. I was amused when I found Baby Ruth candy bars in a certain grave every year, every few days. Oh, no, I'm sorry. 
I was amused when I found baby Ruth candy bars on a certain grave every few days. None of them had actually been eaten. The candy bars just melted each day and reformed into strange shapes until each night until I finally threw them away. A final meal is the next one. After one funeral, a middle-aged man stood near the graveside as we buried his father. When we finally got ready to put the dirt back in the hole, he jumped in front for the backhoe and shouted, Wait! He pulled from his coat a bottle of planters, peanuts, and a six-pack of Coca-Cola. Dad would have wanted these, he said. Can I put them on the vault? Go ahead, I said. So he kneeled down along the grave, but he couldn't quite reach the vault. He then handed them to me and asked me to place them above where his father's stomach was. I did his request and he thanked me. But before he left, I asked, Why are you giving him unsalted peanuts and caffeine-free Coke? Let him live a little. I said it jokingly. Go on, head it up. I said it jokingly, but the man responded very seriously. Dad's on a strict diet. The man marched back to his car and I shrugged at my co-workers who could barely contain their laughter. So beware, apparently some diets last beyond the grave. <laughs> Again, just absolutely no respect for her. It's like, I mean, I guess when you're working around death and in that realm, it's, you're more used to it, but it just kind of shocks me. I would hope that people would have more couth. You know what I'm saying? Like... Maybe he's not ready to accept that his dad's dead. Maybe he wants to continue the idea that his dad's on a strict diet. You know what I mean? Like, take the temperature of the room is what I'm getting at. Okay. Bathroom break is the next one. The fact might surprise you, but cemetery restrooms are a favorite stop for tourists. When I go on vacation... Wait, hold on. Stop. I have to restart. Hold on. The fa this fact might surprise you, but cemetery restrooms are a favorite stop for tourists. Okay, I get it. Um, when I go on vacation, I never consider stopping in a local cemetery to relieve myself. I mean, are they that close to the... I would never think of this either. Um, I didn't know they had public restrooms. Anyways, um... I would never consider stopping at my local cemetery to relieve myself, but nearly every week I had someone with an out-of-state license plate stop by specifically to use the restroom. What amused me was that we weren't even on the main road. Okay, well, here we go. Uh, on the way to the cemetery, you drive past several gas stations and fast food outlets. One winter, it got so cold that a restroom pipe burst. I had to turn off the water and close the restrooms until the weather warmed up. You wouldn't believe how angry some people got when they discovered the toilet was out of order. I tried to keep the restroom clean, but I would personally rather go anywhere than a cemetery. Of course, as you learned in Chapter 4, the cemetery already had a septic tank in place. So, yeah, I mean, if this is true, I agree. That's really, I would not think to stop there if I was on a road trip, uh, especially being out of the way like that. I don't, that, I, I just wouldn't think of that, right? Um, anyways, funny families is the next one. Okay. I often helped families select burial sites after a loved one had died. It was a somber time, but it was often hard to keep a straight face as I listened to their conversations. For example, one of the most common phrases I heard family members say was, Dad will love the view of the mountains from the spot. How, I asked myself, he'll be locked in a box and covered with dirt. And need I remind you, he's dead. I mean, why would you... Th Let's stop for a second. Why would you put that in this book? Again, I will stay by this. Everyone is entitled to their own thoughts, right? Like, I get... Like, I have a dark sense of humor. We all have our moments. We're all human beings, right? I, we get this, right? We might have some thoughts. Why would you take the time to put that on paper? Whatever. And put that out there. That's so crass. And maybe this is like, I don't know this guy, thank God. Maybe this is his attempt at humor. But I'm just like, well, this is like, people are grieving, right? This is like how they're, I mean, I get, of course it doesn't make sense. We know that his, he's dead. He's not going to see the mountains, right? I get it. You know, <laughs> like, I get it, right? Like this, I mean, I get that. But why say that? It's just so inconsiderate. And again, that's what I just find so interesting reading this book is we see this over and over and over. And so it really just shows me how I'm like, oh yeah, I mean, at, sprinkle in the admiration from all these other people surrounding him and like, yes, Chad, yes. 
you've got the portal. Yeah, chat. Yeah, you know, you're the 144 and all this stuff. This was a recipe for a major disaster, right? Okay, let's keep going. The next one is called Rival Relatives. There's a beautiful headstone in our cemetery that was on the corner of an intersection. It was a three-tiered granite stone a part of me that I always liked. A few years later, a relative of that couple passed away and was buried in the lot next to them. When the new headstone arrived, I noticed it was about three inches taller than the older headstone that had been there for years. The two headstones are almost identical except for the height difference. Then a man from a headstone company showed up at my office seeking to locate those two stones. I walked over to the area with him and he just shook his head as he studied them. He pointed at the older stone and said, this couple's daughter came into our shop in a rage. Can you guess why? I smiled and said, her parents' stone is shorter than the new one. Exactly, he said. My only instructions are to make the older stone taller than the new one. So by the end of the day, the older stone was no longer a three-tiered stone and now had four tiers and a three-inch height advantage. I expected a counterattack, but it never came. I'm sure stuff like that happens, right? I mean, I can only imagine that it's like this kind of stuff takes place, right? Please hold. Okay, the next one is War of the Roses. Okay. This next story begins with a man named Randy who regularly beat his wife. He was a troubled soul and he eventually committed suicide. His long-suffering wife brought, bought him a small, simple headstone and then vowed to never do another thing for him. I knew the story and I knew the woman wanted Randy's grave to stay plain without any flowers or decorations. I couldn't blame her. So I was surprised when one spring day... I found rose bushes planted on each side of Randy's headstone. The roses were there for a few days, and then one morning they were gone. I figured someone had stolen them. Three days later, another set of roses was planted there, and they disappeared again within a week. Things really got eerie when roses reappeared there a few days later. I had never seen anyone at the grave. I wasn't sure what to think. Uh, then at my office, then my office phone rang and cleared up the mystery. The caller was the man's widow. And she was angry. She shouted, are there roses planted next to my husband's grave? I told her yes, and she let out a string of profanity. Then she apologized and said, Randy's sister keeps sneaking out there at night and planting roses. Everyone knows how he treated me, and I don't want anything pleasant on his grave, so I've been ripping the roses out, and I'll keep doing it until I die. So for the rest of my time as Sexton, I watched the roses appear and disappear at Randy's grave about twice a month. I stayed out of the dispute because the sister was as determined as the widow. I guess the winner will be the lady who lives the longest. What a sad game. At least that angry widow didn't go to the extreme of one lady who purposely buried her womanizing husband face down. Only the widow, the mortician, and I knew about her request. When I asked the mortician about it after the funeral, he shrugged and told me the wife wanted her husband to meet Satan face to face. All I could think was, either that or he'll have his back to Christ on Resurrection Day. That guy can't win. <laughs> now that, I think, is actually Chad's sense of humor. I think the other stuff is just him being a jackass. Um, so, yeah... The next section, you're not getting away. <laughs> okay, here's a scenario you had to see to believe. During a graveside service, one of the elderly funeral participants injured himself by falling over a headstone. Well, God knows, just have Chad go kick him in the damn ribs and see if he's alive. Uh, the injury was serious enough that an ambulance was called. The paramedics patched up the injured man and loaded him into the ambulance just as the funeral service was ending. It was quite a peculiar sight to see the ambulance pull away, followed immediately by the hearse. As they pulled out uh, of the cemetery, it looked like the hearse driver was right on the ambulance's tail. Anyone passing anyone passing by them on the hol um, hold on anyone passing by them on the highway couldn't help but think the mortuary must be extremely desperate for business. <laughs> okay, Matt the rat. I'll share a little secret about Matt. One, this is not my Matt. This is what Chad is writing. Uh, one of my closest friends, 
Okay, hold on. I'll share a little secret about Matt, comma, one of my closest friends. Matt worked at the cemetery while he was in high school, and one of his favorite Friday night activities was to take girls to the cemetery and put a scare into them. Uh huh. Uh, of course, Matt had one advantage that few others did. He knew where the open graves were. Matt would nonchalantly walk around, walk along slightly ahead of his date, and then with a frightened shout, he would accidentally fall into the grave. You can imagine the shock and fear that would pass to the poor date. She would inevitably scream in terror and nearly faint. The and Matt would hop out of the grave and say, did it scare you? He was lucky any of them ever spoke to him again, although one of them actually married him. Okay, on that, that's the end of the chapter. So Matt, right there, are you kidding me? Like, I can't, what? No, that's absolutely insane. Like, absolutely not. Like, I mean, who would even think to do that? That would scare the living hell out of me if somebody did that. Like, I would never even go, like, I wouldn't do that on a first date. What? No. Absolutely not. That's so weird. Again, with this chapter, we just get deeper and deeper into the fact that this guy, meaning Chad Daybell, y'all, this guy is a complete psychopath. He has absolutely no respect for human beings, for the deceased, for people, for himself, for really anybody at that matter, right? <sighs> I mean, the comments that he made in here is just this nonchalant. It's like he gets more confident with it as the book goes on, right? Just this whole thing of like, it's almost like you're listening to a worker who's over their job and has done it so long and they're just over it. And so they're putting these thoughts out that might be thoughts they have amongst other people in the business and coworkers that you don't necessarily share outside of that because you know people outside of that are going to be like, well, why would you say that? Like, you know, that doesn't make sense. Like nobody else gets it, right? Like nobody else is going to get this kind of thing of being like, oh God, did you see her? She came and decorated her, like, dead kid's grave. You know, it's so annoying. Like, nobody's going to understand that, right? We're going to all be like, why would you say that? You know what I mean? Like, that's a terrible thing to say. You see what I'm saying? I would venture to say probably his coworkers to even say that. But, oh, no, he has it all written through here. The next chapter is Chapter 9, Beware of Meddling Ghost. I shudder to think the blasphemy that follows in this. So, again, it's called Beware of Meddling Ghost. I absolutely believe in ghosts. Well, that's not going to serve him well, then I can tell you that. I hope they haunt the living shit out of him. Okay. However, I don't picture them as spooky apparitions and white sheets, but as disembodied people, because that's what they are. I think the popular movies Ghost and The Sixth Sense came pretty close to reality in depicting what happens to dead people who don't go straight to a different realm. Some of the ghosts I dealt with act as if they have some unfinished business to take care of before moving on, such as Patrick Swayze's ghost character. And wasn't that such a damn good movie, y'all? Uh, oh, God bless us all. God, Patrick Swayze, that is. Um, others seem to not know they are... Others seem to not know they are dead, such as Bruce Willis's character in The Sixth Sense. I also think there is a third group of spirits who realize they are dead, but they don't know how to move on to the next level. So they hang out in familiar places, such as where they were buried. Y'all, I think we're getting into some damn zombie stuff. I mean, this is what I'm talking about. This could be triggering. Some people truly are... Oh, I thought the camera turned off. I was like, what? I mean, deer and headlights. Okay. Some people are truly more receptive to these so-called ghosts. One lady I know is very sensitive. Wherever she sets foot in the cemetery, she gets extremely jittery. She will say, I can feel them closing in and things like that. She doesn't visit the cemetery much anymore. That's a, okay. I mean, we could have actually gone on. I wanted to know more about that. Again, you know, I'm very hypercritical of this. You would think I'm some damn New York literary agent going through this. Please hold. And here's the other thing. Like, if I read, like, actual decent literature, I mean, I'm not going to sit here and rip it up like this. I mean, this is easy to rip up, right? I mean, come on. Like, this, this just beckons for it, right? Anyways. Uh, and it's fun too, right? It's Chad Daybell's book. I mean, my God. Um, it's the least we can do. Okay, the next, so there's like another little section here. It's called, We're Not Alone and They Aren't Aliens. My God, I can't roll my eyes hard enough at this stuff. I mean, Jesus. Okay, I'm not... I'm not as sensitive as that woman is to the spirits, but after becoming the sexton... I mean, Jesus. 
I never thought I would run into a scenario where I was like, he is giving Sexton's a bad name. Like, I never thought that's a sentence I would use in my lifetime. And here I find myself being like, this is literally, if it's possible to give Sexton's a bad name, Chad Daybell has done it. Okay? Anyways. But after becoming the Sexton, I became more aware of what I called the shadows. Nearly every day at the cemetery, I called unexplained movements out of the corner of my eye. At first, I thought my mind was playing tricks on me, but it happened so frequently that it became commonplace. For example, there was a certain tree in the middle of the cemetery where someone seemingly moved behind it each time I went by, almost like a child playing hide-and-seek with me. Visitors to the cemetery had many such ex experiences near that tree. The next section is, Hey, Eddie, can you lock up tonight? The most tangible ghostly experiences I had as, as a sexton occurred after we buried a guy named Eddie. He'd been known in the town as a vagrant and a petty thief. His burial spot wasn't far from my office, and almost immediately after his funeral, I started noticing weird things happening. The first thing I noticed was the window in the women's restroom would be opened about two inches each morning when I'd come to work. I knew for certain I'd lock the doors and latch the windows. The biggest tip-off was that these weird events were supernatural. Wait. The biggest tip-off that these weird events were supernatural came when I found... A rusted walkway gate had been closed. I had tried several times to loosen the rusted lock so I could close the gate, but it wouldn't budge. But four days after Eddie's burial, I noticed the gate was closed, with that rusted lock still in place. I still can't comprehend how he did that. Then, two days later, the combination lock on our equipment compound was open when I arrived. This was peculiar. Since I always drove by and double-checked it when I left at night, after it would happen three times, within a week, I strongly suspected Eddie was still picking locks, despite being dead. Okay. As I left work that day, I tucked a piece of plastic around the lock in a certain way so I could tell if someone touched it. You know what this reminds me of? Do you, if you all saw the color purple when it was like, I done rigged that mailbox so I could tell if somebody's been messing with it. You know what I'm talking about? Chad's like, I done, what is, I done rigged that cemetery gate so I could tell if somebody's been messing with it. Okay, let's go back. I just had a color purple flashback. Loved that movie. Oh my God. Literally have seen it hundreds of times. Okay. That night, I went to the store for my wife at about 9 p.m. Then I drove to the cemetery. Okay, sorry, all this stuff just came through on my phone. Um, I went to the that night. I went to the store for my wife at about 9 p.m. God bless Tammy. Uh, then I drove to the cemetery to check the lock. It was fastened securely, just as I had left it. As you can guess by now, when I arrived early the next morning, the lock was undone. <laughs> Also, the plastic was still in place, but the gate even had been pushed open for a few inches. I wasn't very amused by this ghostly prankster. The biggest surprise came moments later when I checked the shed next to my office. I always secured it with a large lock that required a key, but not only was the shed unlocked, but the lock itself was now hooked on the latch two feet above the door. By this point, I wasn't scared. I was mad. I figured Eddie was nearby, probably pleased I had noticed his handiwork. So I turned around and shouted, Hey, Eddie, listen to me. I'm impressed with your skills, but you're going to get me in trouble. What if someone sees the open lock and steals the backhoe? I would get fired. I paused for a few seconds, and then I added, Eddie... You don't belong here. There's a better place for you. Look around you. Go toward the light and don't come back. Then I stomped into my office. I never had another problem with locks. I mean, my God, the pro literally the stay off my lawn, but he's sending damn goes back to the light. I just, this kind of stuff, I mean, and who knows, but I'm just like, it really, that's all it took. 
you see these damn TV shows based on this damn poltergeist where they have to get people coming in throwing tennis balls and shit in places, you know, to get stuff to happen, but he just has to yell out, go towards the light, and then it all happens. Okay, got it. You know, plays all. Okay. The next thing is called keeping me company. Come and knock on my door. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why I busted the one. If you know that's from dropping in the comments. <laughs> anyway. Okay. <laughs> okay. It was when I was alone in the cemetery office, usually on a frigid, foggy days, that I could most often sense otherworldly visitors. On such, <clears throat> on such days, I would catch up on my record keeping, and it rarely took long before I noticed the hair on my back. Oh, wait. The hair on the neck oh, plays out. It. Oh my god, the sentence. Okay. On such days, I would catch up on my record-keeping comma, and it rarely took long before I noticed the hair on the back of my neck standing on end comma, as if someone was leaning over my shoulder watching what I wrote down, period. There, my God. I don't even know if it's his sentence as much as I just can't say it, right? It's kind of late at night. It's 1.30 in the damn morning when I'm filming this, y'all. <laughs> no wonder. Just so side note, it's um, a Saturday night. I had to work all day and we have to do all this stuff tomorrow and I have to film another video in the morning. And so I fell asleep on the sofa and like slept for hours with Roscoe and woke up and I was like, I'm wide awake. And so I was like, I better go ahead and film stuff for next week because I have to work basically every single day. So just a little bit of that insider information into the you know, behind the scenes filming schedule. So it's 1.30, so that's why I'm kind of like, I, I can't read right now. Anyways, let's keep going. Okay, so... We did that. We read that. Did that. Okay. So when the cemetery was deserted, I could almost guarantee my ghostly friends would migrate over to the office to see what I was up to. I could sense when they were nearby, and I knew they didn't mean any harm. But I had to smile each time I found a pen had moved about six inches from where I left it, or that the page of my day planner was already turned when I arrived the next day. That must have taken them a lot of effort. Now, here's my whole damn thing. Here's somebody who has literally spit in the face of grieving, loved ones and all this stuff. I'd be personally damn scared of the ghost. I mean, I would be afraid of what they would have to say because I'm just like, I don't think they would like you. You've sat here and ridiculed them all, you know, and their, fam their surviving family members. They probably don't have anything nice to say. I mean, that's just my thoughts. Okay, I didn't sense any women among them. It was more like five men who you'd find hanging out in a coffee shop. I don't know, wait, I don't know what these spirits did when I wasn't around. Maybe they each patrolled a cemetery section, but there were days when I had to say, guys, get out of here. I'm trying to get some work done. They thankfully obliged. Thankfully, that's a... I mean, thankfully, I mean, that, that counts, right? I mean, they thankfully obliged. I mean, that's kind of like an odd one, right? Anyways, it's not my fault is the next section. Not every lingering spirit in the cemetery is friendly. We're going to get, okay, so we're going to talk in a minute about this now. Because, again, well, let's talk about it now. Notice how... He has this whole, so now we know, like, right, that he had this whole system, and it was like, someone's gone dark, and this and that, and blah, 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 right? And, you know, oh, the zombie this, and the zombie that. Again, do we think that this stuff is real? I mean, I, I don't, right? Um, do we think that he believed it? I mean, I can't see how he did, but with seeing this kind of stuff, which, I mean, this is more... This is getting into the talk of do you believe in afterlife and all that kind of stuff, basic, right? But Chad t always takes it to this next level of, oh, well, of course he's going to have encounters with spirits, right? He's the type that would. You know, do we think that he personally did? Well, who knows? Uh, but he's going to, of course, say he did. 
but these beginnings, like he is going to always be someone who has these very particular things happen to him, right? We've kind of figured out that he steals other people's stories and pretends that they happen to him, right? So that's kind of what I'm getting at, where I'm just like, you see the beginnings of this, of like he has access to this other world stuff. He has this ability to interact with these spirits so on and so forth so let's keep going not every lingering spirit in the cemetery is friendly there was a grave where i sensed terrible anger and i knew why see what i'm talking about um the problems began where a man got fed up with his wife and shot her to death i mean here we go then he killed himself the two were buried side by side and that was a very tense funeral we even had police officers on hand because the tension between the two families was ugly the wife's family didn't want her to be buried near him can't really blame them but his family paid for the burials and wanted it that way okay wait let me put this together for a second so he took his wife out and then took himself out his fan he had but the wife's family didn't want her to be buried with him, but his family paid for the burials and wanted it that way. I mean, why? Maybe they'll tell us, okay? Anyway, whenever I was near that grave, well, they don't tell us, so let's talk about it. <laughs> let's figure it out for a second. Let's try and snoop a little bit. So these are the things that I'm just like, I mean, I guess everything's different, but I'm like, well, why would they want that? Maybe they could afford to do that. Maybe they couldn't afford to, and they were like, well, we want you to pay for it over here. And the family was like, no, we're going to do it this way, but why would you do that? I don't know. Anyways, anyways, okay. I'm trying to figure out other people's problems. We don't even know if it's real or not. You're going to be lying, right? Anyways, so whenever I was near that grave, I could sense the husband was still around, and he was still as unhappy as he, as the as on the day he killed himself. I have read near-death accounts where people who unalive themselves victims are seen following their families around begging for forgiveness they haven't moved on to the next level this this right here y'all uh, i knew the guy wasn't mad at me but he knew i could sense him and he wanted a listening ear he would plead his case to me saying it's not my fault that i shot her she made me do it Yes, I told him to go to the light, but he didn't go anywhere. There were times when I sensed he wasn't there, but he would. Uh, but he often arrived a few seconds later. I started tidying up his grave with a poor, tormented soul. And that, it ends right there. Why did he put in there, I started tidying up his grave? Like, I mean, that's just weird. Anyways, uh, there's no tree root. It's the next section. There's one sec there is one hold on there's one section of the cemetery that is more elevated than the rest. I always felt a peaceful feeling there and I sensed it was a sacred spot to the Native Americans who once inhabited the region. My feelings were confirmed one day as we dug a grave in that area when we had dug down about 4 feet. I started feeling very dis disturbed something was definitely wrong i finally stopped the backhoe and said to tony is everything all right i'm feeling strange he looked at me and said i feel weird too we couldn't figure out why though so i re I resumed digging. When I swung the backhoe bucket around again to put the next scoop of soil into the dump truck, I got my answer. Jutting out of the soil in the truck bed was what appeared to be a long stick, but I knew better. Tony, go look at that stick, I called out. He walked over and grabbed it, then dropped it immediately. It's a leg, he shouted. I turned off the backhoe and put my gloves on. We spent the next few minutes recovering ancient body parts. I then hopped onto the grave hold on i then hopped down into the grave and cringed to see okay wait i then hopped down into the grave and cringed to see i had excavated an old skeleton from the ribs down interestingly uh the body was buried in a north south direction as some native tribes once buried their dead i also found a bright blue cloth around his shoulders and i got the impression this person had been a great leader or chief, especially since he was buried at the highest point in the area. All we could do was take the bones we recovered and bury them next to the parts we hadn't disturbed. We shifted the new grave about over about two feet to avoid digging up any more ancient bones, and we covered the skeleton the best we could. Once we were done, 
uh, a calm feeling came over me as if an ancient spirit understood it had been an accident and he just wanted us to keep all of his bones in the same place. The next day when we filled in that grave, we used the exact dirt we had taken out just in case we missed a bone or two. I wanted to keep that ancient chief happy. So now again, here's the thing with Chad that oops, that we constantly see is it's like these Chad, Melanie Gibbs, all these people that we see, they so bad want to be in touch with like this higher authority, this higher calling, this higher being, like whatever, right? From uh, very early on, right? And they just, they, they want to be special. They want to have a connection that no one else has. You know, they want that and they want to claim that, right? Like I felt different as I was, you know, vandalizing the grave. I got a feeling that this was special, you know? And I'm just like, you know, and but just all throughout this, right? And it's so bizarre. But also knowing what we know about them, it's not bizarre, right? Because they're all a bunch of like narcissists, right? Okay, anyways, bad vibes. And that's the name of it, but it's also bad vibes, right? Um, there were other parts of the cemetery where bad feelings were very strong. Uh, I can tell you where they probably generated from his damn office, right? <laughs> that was the mothership of them right there that they all came out of. Uh, <laughs> just like a wah, wah pulsating from his damn office. Okay. I have yet to determine why, but there is one corner of the cemetery that I always had a strange feeling about. Although there is no logical reason for it, it was as if someone was watching me and it made the hair on my arms stand up. I hadn't ever told anyone about it, though. Then one day our secretary brought me a burial order and said, I hate that part of the cemetery. It gives me the creeps. I looked at the paper and sure enough, the burial order was in the exact area that gave me chills. I was surprised at her statement and I explained to her the feelings I got in that spot. She just grimaced and actually shivered from head to toe. It feels like someone is playing with my hair when I'm over there, she said. I hate it. Now the next section is my employee saw a spirit. Yeah. Most days at the cemetery were fairly mundane, but every once in a while we had a ghostly experience. We had ghostly experiences. In this case, I hadn't seen I didn't see anything but my two co-workers dead. I'll call them Derek and Sam to protect their privacy. They've told the same story. They've told the story many times, but it has been a few years and maybe they're tired of talking about it. We were filling a grave in a part of the cemetery where many original settlers were buried. Once the vault was in the ground, I drove the backhoe to our dirt pile a few hundred yards away. When I returned with a scoop of dirt, I hold on, I saw Derek and Sam both backing away. Hold on. When I returned with a scoop of dirt, I saw Derek and Sam both backing away from the grave. Sam was pointing at something and Derek actually hid behind Sam. At that point, the backhoe was close enough that they turned to look at me. Something had clearly spooked them. I dumped the dirt in the grave and then saw and then turned off the machine and hopped out. Derek and Sam started shoveling the dirt as if nothing had happened. But then Sam asked me, did you see him too? What do you mean? I asked. They looked at each other in surprise. Sam stammered for a moment before walking to a spot about 10 feet from the grave. There was a boy standing right here, Sam said. He was watching us. Derek said, yeah, he was probably eight years old, about four feet tall. He had on some clothes like he was from the Great Depression, but he vanished when you got closer with the backhoe. As he said that, I felt a little freaked out as well. Could you see through him, I asked. They both shook their heads. I thought he was a real kid at first, Derek said. He had dark hair, but his skin looked kind of gray. He stood there for at least 30 seconds. Uh, he actually looked kind of mad. Sam added, I was glad he disappeared when you drove back over there. We discussed that boy many times during the rest of the summer. The interesting thing to me is that both Derek and Sam saw him. Okay, there it is. There it is. I'm rejecting the book. I, I, we actually got through a lot of it for my body, didn't it? Shocking since it's so late at night that I'm reading this, that my body's rejecting it. And it might be that I'm scared of this part. kind of scares me, right? Um... I checked the cemetery records, and there were three young boys buried in that area who died in the 30s. So maybe one of them just wanted to stop by and see how things were going. So the next part's called Don's Remarkable Story. I became friends with a frequent cemetery visitor named Don. He was in his 70s, and his wife Karen had passed away two years earlier. 
he would visit her grave often and he would even help me out sometimes with the burial. Don was a very happy person, but he told me after his wife died he became a bitter, broken man. As we got to be close friends, he told me his story. Karen had died of cancer and she had suffered greatly during the last months of her life. Don had taken care of her every day, and when she died, his grief basically incapacitated him. He told me the only reason he got out of bed each day after Karen passed away was to drive to the cemetery. Then one day while at Karen's grave, Don heard her voice. She told him she was doing fine in heaven and that he needed to get back to living a normal life again. She said his grief was actually hindering her on the other side, and she received permission to speak to him. She told him she works as a secretary there, helping keep things in order. This information turned Don's grief into happiness. Uh, Karen has continued to communicate with him. One of their daughters uh, died unexpectedly, and Karen assured Don that their daughter was now working with her in a similar capacity. Don looks forward to reuniting with them both someday. He says that one so he says that those secretaries probably needed someone to empty the trash cans once in a while. Yeah, 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 yeah. Truly scared. There is an actual mood change in a cemetery once the sun sets. I wouldn't necessarily call it sinister, but certainly it is more frightening and intense. Despite all the time I spent in the cemetery, if I had to go out there at night, I was definitely on edge. Every sound made me jump, but my scariest experience in the cemetery happened in broad daylight. One woman's grave was well known for being supposedly haunted and I avoided it. But it so happened that a lady died and would be buried in the plot the ne next to the haunted grave. In order to get the new burial in the right spot, I needed to use one of our metal probing rods to locate the haunted grave. I should have waited until a co-worker was with me, but I didn't. I'd, I've gone over the next few seconds in my mind a thousand times, but there's no denying that when that pro probing rod hit the haunted vault, a jolt of electricity shot through my body. I dropped the rod and just stood there, unable to believe what I had just felt. I grabbed the rod one more time and probed the ground again. This time when I hit the vault, it felt like somebody shoved me viciously in the chest. I dropped the rod and took off running to toward my office with what I considered to be a demon right on my tail. Uh, I couldn't see this otherworldly creature, but it felt but I felt it clawing at me as it tried to knock me down. My body was covered in goosebumps and I was praying aloud all the way. My office was several hundred yards away, but I covered the distance in record time. I was honestly terrified. One of my teenage workers came out of the office and the demon thankfully disappeared. My employee approached me and said, Man, you look pale. Are you all right? I nodded and decided not to tell him what happened. In fact, I only told a handful of people about this experience for a long time, but it was very real. Now, this next part's underlined, so let's see what that means. I've also decided that whatever attacked me wasn't the actual spirit of the haunted grave's occupant, but something more sinister that had drawn, been drawn there through improper rituals. Interesting. That's why. Very interesting. I've heard of people doing satanic rites in cemeteries, and all I can say is that if they knew what they were messing with, they would run the other way. Uh -huh. One girl I went to high school with experimented with that stuff one weekend at the cemetery, and whatever happened to her that night altered her whole personality. She changed from being bubbly, happy girl to being a basket case. Could this possibly have happened to him? If you take part in such things in or out of a cemetery, you are foolish and will certainly regret ever doing so. I mean, y'all, this is very interesting here. If No, I did Okay. Anyway, we still had to dig that grave the next day. I moved the grave as far... I dig the... I, hold on. I moved the grave as far from the haunted grave as I could. I wasn't going to risk the chance of another supernatural encounter. We didn't have any more problems. <laughs> Excuse me. Though, I figured I unleashed that demon and now it hopefully was gone for good. Warm feeling is the next. Um, in direct contrast to that experience, one of my most memorable events of life occurred when a neighbor lady I had really admired was buried. She was a true saint, and after her graveside service, the family was gone and the vault guy hadn't arrived yet. So it was just me and her at her graveside. A warm feeling filled my heart, and I knew I was in the presence of an angel. My friend was telling me goodbye and that she was moving on to a better place. That feeling stayed with me, and it gave me hope. I believe that for the vast majority of us, death will be a pleasant improvement over our current situation. 
And that's the end of the chapter. The ritual thing in this one stood out to me for this one. Again, we didn't hear too many things in this one of him like insulting people, which is shocking, but his need to feel a connection, his need to feel a, I have a connection to spirit world. I have access to that realm, that ability to see that, that ability to connect, that kind of a thing. I find interesting. You know what I'm saying? Because again, it's especially knowing what we know now, right? Because he's the type of person that claims to have all this like well i have my you know list of you know the dark people and the not dark people and the zombies and the not zombies and all this stuff right uh, i mean you can see that this has been going on for quite some time and it's probably just finesse this finesse along the way so there's that so it's chapter 10 and it's called can you see it well anyway it doesn't matter it's called a final few tips so there we go this chapter is devoted to those people who have made who have to make some tough decisions concerning a relative's burial. These choices usually come after an unexpected death in the family, when everything is hectic and there is only a short time to make major decisions. Hopefully these hints will stick in your mind if you have to handle such a crisis. Okay, so the next little like thing right here is don't buy expensive flowers. Now, gee, my, my God. This man's obsession with flowers throughout this, and we have, okay, now, I'm gonna, so sidebar, so sidebar. One thing that has been interesting, because if you have been following me for this, you know that I don't believe anything this guy says, right? You know if you've been following me and all this, that I'll come to y'all and be like, okay, I don't believe anything that Chad says. And so y'all will be like, no, actually, like, I know this because of blank, you know what I'm saying? So like, for example, him talking about things being stolen or the flowers being stolen, and I've had several people, no, actually, it's a thing. You know, this just happened, and I'm like, oh my god. So, it's just funny that he starts off with the expensive flowers things. So like, this man is obsessed with flowers in the graveyard, right? It's like it's things that go hand in hand, right? And he is like obsessed, impressed about it, this whole damn book. Anyways, let's go. Okay, so don't buy expensive flowers. Many times we had funerals that required two large mortuary bands to bring all of the flower flower arrangements people had purchased to honor the deceased but once the mourners were gone all i could do with the flowers was try to arrange them on the grave within a week every last blossom was dead and i threw them in a dumpster can they not be mulched and i mean i'm just again help me out here i don't know these things and i'm being petty okay because it's this is my bias because i don't like this guy right this might be the easiest thing to throw them away i don't um, so anyways, um, when you multiply 50 flower arrangements by a very conservative $40 each, that's at least $2,000 worth of flowers rotting away in the garbage by the end of the week. What a waste of money. Obviously, every funeral needs a few flowers, but money is often a family's biggest concern at such times. Placing a $20 bill in the hand of a grieving widow will mean much more and be more valuable than a dying blossom. Of course, many families include at the end of the obituary in lieu of flowers, please donate to the Diabetes Foundation or something like that. I've often wondered how many people actually do that or if they, if they, or if they just call the florist. Okay, so here's my thing, and I get what he's saying by that because we've all seen this, right? And I've noticed that as times progress from, like, say, when I was younger, this has become a more popular thing of in lieu of, right? Okay, so here's my thing when it comes to something like this. If somebody wants to put money or put, hold on, if somebody wants to put flowers on a grave, whether they can afford it or not, and that's how they're going to do that situation, that is their damn business. Okay, you know what I'm saying? Like, that's their way to grieve. That is their business. It's up to them and whoever the person might be, right? You know what I'm saying? So, and what I mean by that is, if this is the family and they've said, you know, yep, yeah, bring flowers, and somebody wants to use their last twenty dollars to put flowers in there. Okay, you know what I'm saying? I get from a perspective of somebody who works in the business where it can look like a waste of money, right? Being like, oh my God, all these flowers, this money could go to this, whatever. But this isn't like, you know, you're not burying your grandfather every day of the week, right? You know what I'm saying? This is a once, in, you know, this, you're not, these are like irreplaceable family members. So that's one thing with 
Chad that I find so interesting. And while I get that when you're in this business, it becomes just that a business, but he's so pressed about some basic things. And I'm like, just allow somebody to mourn in their own right. Now, mind you, I want to expect him to do that. Right. Because I mean, look who we're dealing with, but on the same note, it's like, well, let people mourn the way they want to mourn. If they want to spend $2,000 on flowers and throw them in the dumpster, let them do it. You know what I'm saying? Like, let them do it. And if they want to put the thing in lieu of flowers instead, let them do it. Like this is their choice. Right. Um, because it's just such a personal thing. So anyways, and the next thing is just as it just goes hand in hand. Okay. The next little subtitle is called a coffin is a coffin. Can't roll my damn eyes hard enough. Don't overspend on funeral hardware. A $500 coffin will work just as well as a $5,000 one. I want to put money on. I want to keep up with this damn case until he's six feet under. Guarantee you, if unless he goes out in a damn, uh, you know, whatever kind of thing they bury you in the prison, he would have a $5,000 casket if he could. I'm just saying. Anyways, here's a message to my family. Oh, well, we're going to hear from the damn horse's mouth. Here's a message to my family. When it's my time to go, I want a very economical funeral. The simplest coffin will do. A prison coffin. A good mortician will assure you that your departed loved one deserves the very best. Even if your relative died in the electric chair. Oh, my God. It's like he, he made his own future. Uh, even if your relative died in the electric chair, the mortician is just doing his job. And if it takes a strong person to tell a mortician that you don't want the very best. But it's not like you're choosing between a 1968 Volkswagen bus and a brand new Ferrari. I've yet to see anyone driving around town in a coffin. Y'all. <laughs> There's the first one. There it goes. Yeah, if, again, if you follow me and you watch me read this, you know my body starts to like reject the book and all that, and I begin yawning. Yeah, I'm on page two, and it's starting. Luckily, it's not that much we have to go, so it's not like we're going to have to stop. Um, have you had to see anyone driving around town in a coffin? Once the dirt is piled on, no one will remember what you were packed away in. The same goes for your burial vault. Oh, my God, the damn vault. A less expensive vault usually works just as well as the most costly one. Heck, you're dead. Who cares? Yes, some vaults look fancier, but the only real difference between a $300 vault and one that sells for $1,500 is usually only two coats of spray paint and a plastic liner. That's some expensive paint. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I, again, oh, wait, here it goes. The big selling point of the plastic liner is it will keep any moisture away from your loved one. The following story might convince you otherwise. Okay, then it's the next little thing here. Let me get a sip of this just to kind of keep myself going. This is another reason why I could not continue. If this book was longer, I'd be like, I can because my body is now rejecting it like one page. I'm right. I'm just like, my spirit is shunning the book. Okay. So the next thing is called don't drink the water. I shudder to think what we're about to read. Okay. We once received a burial order to move a woman's body to the other end of the cemetery. She had only been in the ground for 10 months, so we figured it would be an easy job. We dug down and got the chains around the vault, but I couldn't budge it when I pulled back on the backhoe lever. We were perplexed because the backhoe usually had no trouble lifting the vault out of the ground. I fought it for a while and finally got one of the vault out of the... Wait, we fought it. Hold on. Please hold. We were perplexed, comma, because the backhoe usually had no trouble lifting a vault out of the ground, period. I fought it for a while and finally got one end of the vault out of the hole, period. The poor woman was now standing on her head, comma, but it was my only option. Okay, that was like just me having to break it down for myself. Um, I turned off the backhoe and my crew joined me at the side of the vault. That woman must have weighed 400 pounds, one of the crew members said. I shook my head because I had known the deceased, and she had been a small, thin woman. The vault must be full of water, I said. The crew argued with me because they noticed it was a sealed vault of the spray-painted 1500 variety. Finally, I grabbed a pick from the shed. Then carefully broke off the bottom corner of the vault until I could see the plastic liner. 
Watch this, I said. I just feel like he talks like that with everything, right? Then I poked the end of the pick through the plastic and instantly a stream of gray water poured out. It took nearly three minutes to drain the vault. After that, we had no trouble lifting the rest of the vault out of the hole. In retrospect, her protective liner worked really well, didn't it? <laughs> I mean, he just has this kind of, I told you so. Okay, so the next thing is, sir, would you like fries with that? <laughs> that was a real good one. Okay. Uh, one of the worst cases of going overboard. I've ever seen was when the owner of a large string of fast food restaurants passed away. When the vault company brought his vault to the cemetery on the morning of the funeral. Here it goes. Here it goes. I had to shield my eyes because it was so shiny and the sun was glinting off of it. I asked the vault guy, what is this thing made out of? He laughed and said, I think it is titanium. They ordered it from out of state. He said it cost the family six grand plus an extra thousand fee because they wanted it placed on a special device above the grave so the mourners could see it. So rather than being in the ground, the vault was actually a hovering a foot above the hole. During the graveside service, oh, hold on, please call me. Sorry. Oh my gosh. I apologize. I mean, my goodness. Um, during the graveside service, the coffin, a $4,000 matching titanium model, was then held above the vault by another fancy device. It was quite the show. After the graveside service ended, we put that vault down in the hole and literally buried 10 grand worth of metal. I hope it keeps the water out. <laughs> I mean, okay. Avoid Saturday funerals is the next one. Often when a family is planning a funeral, they select Saturday so that everyone can be there. That's wise thinking, but here's a little secret. Psst. Um, if the, you've planned the funeral on a weekday, even more people will be there. Why? Because the mourners get to miss work and usually get paid for it. On a Saturday, some of the extended family might find something better to do, but I'll bet they won't miss a weekday funeral. He might be, that might be the damn truth right there, y'all. Um, now, this also goes for minor holidays. No, that also goes for minor holidays. I know most government workers get holidays like President's Day. Sorry, y'all, this is bad. I mean, you're probably, if you're watching this, this is ASMR at this point. I'm putting y'all to sleep. I apologize. Uh, the, this, that also goes for minor holidays. I know most government workers get holidays like President's Day and Columbus Day off. And the last thing they want to do on their day off is attend an uncle's funeral. Uh, now instead, schedule the funeral for Tuesday. That allow, this allows those hardworking government employees to take a much-deserved four-day weekend. Along those lines, families often choose to hold a funeral in the afternoon so people can work half a day before leaving and to attend the funeral. On the surface, that is good thinking, but in reality, the relatives will be wishing you had held it at 10 a.m. By scheduling the funeral earlier in the day, your relatives will likely won't even go to work. The funeral will be finished by early afternoon. Everyone can still get in a round of golf or a trip to the water park before sunset. Their bosses won't be expecting them back and they'll still get paid for a bereavement day. Another reason for holding that funeral on a weekday is that most cemeteries usually charge an extra fee for weekend or holiday burials. Hey, I'm just calling it like I see it. Besides, I like to have my Saturdays and minor holidays off too. That's what it was about. That's what it was about. Okay, that's what he was getting to. He was trying to put the word out because he was selling this book to all these like local little, you know, pampered chef parties and stuff. He was trying to plant the idea of, look, don't be rolling up in here on Saturday. Don't be rolling up in here on damn President's Day. I'm kicking my feet up on that day and I ain't doing doing squat okay now the next section is called a dozen is more than enough when it comes to buying burial lots, please don't feel like you have to provide for the next generation. It's nice to have parents and siblings plan for the future by purchasing plots near each other, but don't go wild with the idea. I'll never forget one man who wanted to buy enough spots to provide for even his great-grandchildren. He wavered back and forth on how many burial plots to buy. He first wanted to buy 100, but he finally set, settled on a mere 48. I mean, my God, isn't that like the whole damn cemetery? Yes, 48. The poor guy penny pinched for 25 years to pay for all of them and then he died the month after they were paid off. Guess how many of those 48 plots he had been used so far? One, his own. I doubt his family will ever appreciate his generosity. Going out in style. 
One day a monstrous Cadillac stopped in front of my office. The window rolled down and the driver motioned for me to come speak with him. He was a large man with diamond rings on nearly every finger. He oozed with wealth. He introduced himself, and I recognized his name. He had grown up in our small little town, but he'd moved to Las Vegas as a young man and made millions of dollars, operating several casinos there. He had more money than I could ever spend. Anyways, he started asking about the size of a typical burial plot. As I told him, he grabbed a pen and paper and scribbled some numbers. Then he said, 32 plots ought to do it. Have you got that many empty spots together? Maybe eight plots across and four deep. We have a few open areas like that, I said. That's pretty generous of you. I'm sure your family will appreciate it. He glared at me and then snorted. It's not for those idiots. It's for me and my baby. I was confused until he tenderly patted the steering wheel of his Cadillac. Just me and my baby. All I ask is you put me behind the wheel and lower me into the ground. I stammered for a second before regaining my composure. Well, you'd probably have to rent a special crane and we'd have to charge you quite a bit more to dig a hole that large. He waved his hand. No problem. I, had, I then joked it might just be easier to just build a crypt for you in the car. He got a gleam in his eye and I wish I had never said anything. Thing. Such a crypt would attract way too much attention in our small town. The man hadn't made his final decision, but someday soon the cemetery crew will likely put the man and his car in the crown in the ground where they will spend eternity together. Thanks for visiting. That brings us to the end of the tour. I hope you had an enjoyable enjoyable informative visit. All I ask is that you be careful out there in the real world. We don't want you coming back here soon than expected. I love the fact that the very last damn sentence has a gram <laughs> grammar mistake in it. It says, we don't want you coming back here soon than expected. I mean, that it, that polishes the book off, right? And I mean, that little story that he finished it off on, I'm like, really? Okay, so no, wait, please, I'll, I'll hear it about the author. Now we do get to rate it. What what do y'all think we should rate this at? Five stars? Oh, I'm just joking. You already know we're going for one. Hell, it doesn't even get that, but we have to give it one to do that. I mean, obviously, right? Anyways, about the author. In addition to working for more than a decade as a cemetery sexton, Chad Dable has worked in the publishing business for the past two decades and has written nearly 30 books. He is currently the president of Spring Creek Book Company. Visit springcreekbooks.com to see the comp company's lineup of titles. Learn about Chad at his personal website, cdbell.com. Hmm. So that's it, y'all. Final thoughts? You already know. It's, I, I mean, come on. Again, the last sentence with the grammar misspelled. With the was misspelled, not misspelled. How do you say that? Because it's not a misspelled word, but it's like grammar, right? Is that right? I mean, again, y'all, this guy has some serious issues, right? I mean, the level of narcissism. And I, again, I'm not a psychologist, so I don't know. I call it narcissism because, I mean, just from what we've learned in this book, I mean, this guy literally is like equates himself to like the president of the United States, right? And like the self importance that we see in this book of him being the cemetery sexton is just astounding to me. You know what I'm saying? Like, I could see somebody who has been in this industry, like having something worthwhile to say, right? Because obviously there might be some things that we never really thought of, but the level of like self-importance that came through in this, like it didn't need to be this long, right? This is literally like a bullet point list, right? Like, hey, things to think of, you know what I'm saying? Um, and then these stories that he comes up with, and then the, uh, the plagiarizing of stories, all this kind of stuff. Can you hear Roscoe's awake now? So another thing that it makes me really sit here and think is like, okay, if these are the things that this guy is publicly coming out here with, you know, obviously we know he's done these teachings, this kind of thing. I've not read any of his other books. God help me. I don't think I can bring myself to do it. Um, I mean, just imagine like what he's like, what, or what he was like, like at home, right? Like with his own kids or like with people in his inner circles. Cause remember, look at how these people viewed him as like this, like, and all be all person that like had this, you know, insight into all this stuff. I mean, he lapped that up. Look at what he was doing just as the guy who dug the graves up. I mean, come 
on, right? I mean, it, it, it baffles me. So can you imagine how toxic he was when people were legit looking at him like he held, like, the key to life, okay? Like... I mean, y'all, this is like, I can see how this guy was so sick as to think of like end of times and I have all the answers and I'm, I'm worthy enough to deem people, you know, on this scale and zombie or not zombie and make this up and make that up and all this kind of stuff and play God and all this absolute nonsense, complete nonsense that they were involved in. Um... Because he was already doing it, it, you know, like I said, just doing this. So, it, it just makes, I mean, I just feel bad for the daily torments that he probably put innocent people, obviously the ones who are no longer with us, through, right? Um, all at the, the, under the guise of, you know, his savior complex, his god complex, all this stuff, so... That being said, and God only knows, like, the little things that nobody will ever know except for him that he probably did. Like, he strikes me as this kind of person that would get pleasure out of, like, it's like, say, I'm making this up, right? But, like, say he was, like, and I don't know exactly how it works, but, like, say he's burying someone and he knows that he switched the bodies of the grave. You know what I'm saying? Like something sinister like that. Like he knows he buried Mary where Bill was supposed to go. You know what I mean? At the local grave that he worked at. And he gets pleasure out of that when he sees them come visit their family plot. You know what I mean? Like he's that kind of person to me, right? Um, because we already saw how much pleasure he got out of like telling people no to things and like this kind of weird stuff. So... Anyways, um, <sighs> probably going to trade my damn phone in after this one, y'all. I don't think Sage will work. I really don't. I just, I, I feel it's possessed. I feel like I'm shocked it hasn't melted down, to be honest. Um, I haven't yawned either since I stopped. I swear to God, that is the devil talk. I mean, I swear to God, it is. It's just, it's so weird, right? How it's like my body, like I say, my body just like spiritually rejects the book. Um, so, anyways, that's it. Thank you for hanging in with me while we read through this. You know, I mean, again, it was it was an interesting glimpse into his twisted mind, um, just to kind of get a, 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 a snapshot of that thought process. So, please show some love to the victims in the comment section, for God's sakes. Um, let's cross our fingers for justice. Let's cross our fingers that they never see the light of a day. This is just the kind of stuff that when we go through this and we see what makes people tick like this, and we know obviously what they did, allegedly, they don't need to ever walk free. Ever. You know what I mean? And I pray that they don't. Um... I mean, these are just vile human beings here, right? Um, Lori and Chad and the other, you know, Alex, these people who all were involved in this stuff and taking the lives of all these innocent people. So anyways, I keep going on. So thank you very much for making this over possible. Thank you for hanging in here. Let me know what you think. Let me know your final thoughts on the book. And uh, I guess until we meet around this damn sofa and we get Roscoe back out of the bed and on the sofa, psh, I'll see you all soon. I just wanted to say thank you again for watching the whole video and also thank you for being part of the Sofa Squad. Special thanks to all the Patreon members, channel members from both of my channels, everybody who likes, shares, subscribes, comments in the comment sections. It helps the channel out so much. Now, don't forget, I do have that other channel, the podcast channel. That's where we go live, we hang out, we talk. Uh, we have kind of sort of a schedule, but just be sure and check it out. I'll put it up here on the screen. Also, if you're looking for merch, be sure to check out my Teespring store. I'll put that up here. And then, like I said in the beginning of the video, if you want to follow me and Roscoe, on the insta on the gram on the instagram go on check it out it's right here on the screen again but once again thank you very much i really appreciate you being part of the sofa squad and i'll see you in the next video